Monday morning of the first Monday of a brand new month on Ramon, Kayla, and Will. RKW is brewed by 8th Roast on 104.5 The Zone as Tennessee goes to Tuscaloosa and brings their brooms for Nate Oates and the Crimson Tide. The NFL Combine finishes up today with bench press for the big guys. We talk about our biggest draft crushes of 2024. And profile tape from Bill Callahan has been much discussed at Indy, but what would it have looked like? We discuss with our 11-year NFL veteran this morning on the offensive line. Ramon Foster is his name. Robert Walsh makes the show happen behind the glass. Kayla Anderson with the morning off. My name is Will Bowling. 615-737-1045. Happy Monday, everybody. How are we doing? Hey, what up, Will? What up, Bert? Happy Monday, man. Uh, we're doing good. I was telling you guys, well, I told Will, I'm not sure if Bert heard it, man. You asked him how my weekend was. It was, oh, it was cool. It was all right. Wasn't too crazy. Well, I can tell you why, guys, it wasn't too crazy. We were supposed to have AAU basketball this weekend for my youngest, 11-year-old. Two-time champion, okay, himself. Two years in a row, he has broken something on his foot again. Ugh. Yeah. So his game is supposed to be Saturday, um, Saturday morning. Um, Friday, he goes to a friend's party at a bounce house or a trampoline pit or something like that. Uh, supposedly jumped in a restricted area, of course, because why? <laughs> That's what little brothers do, right? That's Trent. what everybody do. Hey, you're not supposed to do this. Well, I'm going to do it anyway. Well, you know what? A, a hard head made a soft bottom this weekend. <laughs> he broke his foot. So, uh, yeah, we didn't have any basketball this weekend. Also, I think his AU season is just cooked. Because it wasn't a long one. It was just doing something between baseball. Um, well, that's cooked also. So, yeah, he's on crutches. Uh, Got to go to the uh, orthopedic either today or tomorrow also. Goodness. So, yeah, yeah. So, it wasn't like something easy like a toe. It was it was his foot. No, toe was last year. Toe, <laughs> toe was last year. Remember, we did that one at uh, at the beach, remember? It was his big toe. Uh, he fractured just a little bit, and this time, who jumps in a pit with 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 just the foam balls in it? I guess, and it wasn't inflated. Matter of fact, they told you not to go there. This sounds like my talk with him on Friday night. <laughs> <laughs> See, I would hate to be on the other end of one of these talks because uh -huh. I feel like uh, I'm not mad at you. I'm just disappointed from Ramon Foster. <laughs> would feel a whole lot heavier. Than if anybody else was fussing at me, <laughs> because hey, are yeah, Will's a, he's a, he's a, a younger child. Bert, you are the little brother too, or are you the older brother? I'm the oldest. You're the oldest. I'm the eldest boy. Responsible one. A responsible one. That second child, man, is always the one that just goes too far. Mm -hmm. And that was my biggest conversation. With him. It was like, look, I love that you do your thing. But sometimes you take it a notch too far. You And I told him, you and your little friends. I was like, all of y'all just go too far because y'all think y'all are cool. And, man, I, had, I told him, I was like, this time around, I said, because I know you went into a restricted area at this place. I said, and you know you had basketball. I said, and you know you're supposed to make better decisions than this, okay? Like, I, I leaned, I got mad without being fierce, okay? I said it's the worst kind of mad. It, it, it probably was. I'm gonna be real with you. <laughs> I'm gonna be real with you. But I told him, I was like, because of this, and we had to pay for this this season and all this other stuff, you gonna pay us back. I know there's one way to get him is to hit his pockets. So I'm gonna hit his pockets this time. I don't you, care if he's 11. I told you a million times. What's my dad say? Those who don't listen must feel. Must feel. And sometimes, sometimes them kids don't feel pain like everybody else does. Sometimes you gotta hit them in their pockets, man. Yeah. Sometimes my, you gotta hit them with that payback. My question is, what kind of jump place would have a restricted area that people could still get into? How is this not like totally taped off to where you could not possibly? get around the divider. See, that's you, what Mo's young and saying. Like, come on, Dad. Well, why, why is it even open? Why I know. I, why like, if, if, if there's any possibility you can get in there, then why? Like, what? what how is it restricted? No, you're the problem, Will. No, I, I'm, 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 I'm putting the problem on them, these people. This is, this is what, exactly what they were thinking, Will. Like... Well, we can go by still. We can go under the tape. Yeah, if they really were, thought it could hurt us, then they wouldn't make it this easy to get around it. 
You was know? it just like one singular cone? Like what was what was the situation? <laughs> See, you're the problem. You are 100 percent the, the problem. Youngest. Because yes, that that is a thought process that y'all have. Y'all don't think of consequences, man. And I love that for him. I do. I told him I was like, do I appreciate how you roll? I was like, but do you see what I tell you? Be cool, little dog. You you know what that means now? I'm telling them. So Slay says to me all the time. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know. I think I, I'm a bit different, though, because I'm a third child. Okay. And so I watched the mistakes of the first two and then just decided to, like, do my own thing. The second child, though, I feel like is more the stereotypical rebel. Yeah. Because they just want to be different from the oldest. They want to be different. I had such a big difference between me and my siblings that I just like watched the way they lived their lives and just took notes and then learned from their lessons. Did you? That's fair. I'll give that to you. But that that is by far one of the funniest things ever. Like we had a deeper conversation and everything. And of course, me being who I am, I'm I'm like, all right, we, we got it. It's understood. And I turned into a softie, too. I'm out here icing his foot down, so we got like the game ready machine. <laughs> hey, you all right? You you need to shower downstairs. You need to be going up the steps with them crutches, like all of that. I'm like, all right, man. I'm, I'm I got you. I made you feel it. Now let's bring it back in because rehab is most important. Yeah, think about all the stuff that we did that was stupid as kids too. Though, yeah. like all the stuff that we didn't get called for, oh all the my. stuff that uh, that we probably should have gotten trouble for but didn't. That, that that's the reason I can't be too mad if when I have a youngin and he does something like that. I know the blood that runs through your veins. I know the things that I did that could have got me in trouble, but I did not. Yeah. This is payback for that. So I, I might I might need to make that the question of the day this morning on at Ramon Kayla Will on Twitter. What's the dumbest injury you got as a kid? I got, I'm gonna start us off. You ready for it? Go for it. All right, so gas stoves, you see the flame, yep. right? My auntie moved out, and she ended up staying in her own place. She had an electric range, the ones with the circles in it. And for some odd reason, I used to just go by and tap the the stove tops, or whatever the the the, uh, the the hot part, right? The hot plate. Uh, she told me like the day before, baby, stop touching that stove. I'm telling you, you can't tell when it's hot or when it's not, because when it's hot, it turns red, mm-hmm. but immediately it turns black after it starts to cool down. And I went and tapped it. The next day, like she told me not to, and I had a ring around the middle part of my hand. <laughs> you ever seen like those electric stoves with the rings? I was pretty much like uh, on Home Alone. Remember when he touched the door handle? He yeah. had the image. Yeah, I, I pretty much had a in, um, in the middle of my hand. That was I, the dumbest. Dude, I was a pyromaniac as a kid. Well, and it was aided by the fact that my grandpa's house was heated off a wood stove. So we were constantly starting fires in this wood stove <laughs> to heat the house up. And I loved burning stuff in this daggum stove, whether it was sticks, dog food. It did not matter. <laughs> one time, and this is completely adjacent to it, one time I threw a, uh, an unopened can of dog food in this stove just because. <laughs> and my grandma went out there to throw some more wood in the stove, and that thing not only blew up, but when it blew up, it threw all that dog food all over her. It threw ash all over her, covered her in ash. She walked in looking like a cartoon, but that's not where I got hurt. Where I got hurt at is I was throwing wood in, and I was a little fella. I wasn't that much bigger than uh, a standard eight to eight or ten year old. <laughs> and I was going to throw wood in, and I slipped, and I went and reached my hand out and put it on top of that wood stove door, and it burnt. The whole palm yeah, of my hand, yeah. like a bubble, was on my hand, and I, um, my dad was not allowed to play with fire. My dad used to, I used to play with fire so much as a kid. My dad used to tell me, "You're gonna pee in the bed if you yep. look at fire too long." <laughs> To try to deter me from looking at fire. So I just, like, put a couple towels down every night. I was like, I know that I've been looking at fire. I, Preventative I, measures. I am prone to pee in the bed, so I'm going to put a couple towels oh down. Gosh. <laughs> so we're both hand burners, huh? Hand burners? That's our, that's our backup band if uh, hood that's lasagna right. doesn't work. <laughs> well, I've told you my, my story before that I got a concussion because I was standing in a refrigerator box that was long and narrow, jumping up and down saying, I'm Larry the Cucumber. And so I slipped and fell backwards, and I couldn't catch myself, and I landed and hit my head. And my parents learned I had a concussion because they asked me, who's the head coach at South Carolina? And I said, Lou Holtz, and it was Steve Spurrier. And that's how they knew I was concussed. <laughs> that's no on your child right there. I love Will's right. litmus test. They're like, yeah, <laughs> who, who? the coach of Tennessee? Yeah. Who is the coach of South Carolina? Who is the Titans 2021 draft pick? Right now, go. Um, 
Derrick Henry. <laughs> Wrong. Go to the doctor. <laughs> yeah. Genuinely, because Tennessee was playing South Carolina that weekend because it was Halloween weekend because it was our Halloween party at school. Yeah. And I didn't remember that we'd had a Halloween party at school that day. Yeah, they were like, how's flag. the Halloween party? And I was like, what Halloween party? What are you talking about? That's a red flag. And uh, that was that was their sign that I had hit my head. And then well, cause that was back when kids used to go outside and play. It, kids listening, but we used to go out in nature and have fun. And mom would uh, go back on the back porch and yell, "Hey, come on home, supper's ready." And I, I still am at least old enough to have had, to have done that. And this was one of those times that I was jumping up and down, thinking I was Larry the Cucumber, and I yeah. was not. I was singing some silly songs <laughs> afterwards as well. Stop <laughs> it! Me and you're the only people that give a rip about that joke, Will. Oh well, no, there. Uh, they, I, listen, I in it. this area of the country. There are a lot of VeggieTales fans listening to the sounds of our voices right now. Yeah. And, and my wife texted me, too, just now, just reminded me. Also, my my older, my youngest also put a lighter to his hand, too. <laughs> he did. Like father, like son. I'm, I'm telling This is why we always compare you to Miles, right? <laughs> That's why I'm afraid. That's why you're scared. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it is 615-737-1045. At Ramon Kayla Will, our question of the morning. What is the dumbest injury you had as a kid? Now that you have heard ours, uh, see who who else dealt with fire in a bad way when they were growing up. Uh, streaming live on 104.5 The Zone TV, Facebook Live, YouTube, Twitter, or Twitch. Twitch, Twitch please. Please. Coming Here up today. this morning, draft crushes after the NFL Combine. Mike Wilson of the Knoxville News Sentinel at 820. We'll get into that discussion we were going to have on Friday with Ramon about Bill Callahan's profile tape, what he will be looking for and specific traits and qualities in rookie offensive line prospects. We'll get into that this morning at 920. But coming up next, the big headline from the week in this state, Tennessee goes to Tuscaloosa and sweeps Alabama. We'll react to it next. Hey, what's going on? It's Will Bowling. Do you or someone close to you find it maddening to hear conversation when there's background noise? Maybe it's while you're dining at your favorite restaurant. It's crowded in there and you can't hear the person clearly across the table from you. Maybe you're just watching your favorite team play on the hardwood in a crowded arena. Well, if so, I want to introduce you to my friends at Brentwood Hearing Center. With five doctors of audiology, state-of-the-art diagnostic equipment, and the most recent hearing device technology, they'd like to help you get off the sidelines and back in the game of better hearing. And with over 85 years of experience from their convenient location just off of I-65 in Brentwood, they tailor a hearing solution to each individual patient. Give them a call today, 615-377-0420, or visit them online at Brentwood Hearing Center. Dot com. Over 85 years of experience, scheduled appointment on their website at BrentwoodHearingCenter.com. They'll help you get off the sidelines and back in the game. Let the madness be on the court this March. 615-377-0420. That's Brentwood Hearing Center. Better hearing, better life. Here are some facts about engagement rings you need to know. There are 10 premier Brado design- designers every woman knows about. They're like the Mercedes or the Louis Vuitton of engagement rings. World-class, iconic quality names. Names like Takori and Viraggio. These designers are hard to get. Every jewelry store wants them, but very few make the cut, so they have to settle for lesser brands or knockoffs. Around here, there's only one jewelry store that offers these premium rings. It's Genesis Diamonds. Genesis is the only one that made the cut that meets the highest standards. Genesis 
Genesis is the only store that's allowed to offer these exceptional brands that women really want. Other stores are jealous of this and will try to try and convince you that these are more expensive and try to get you to settle for us something else. But the truth is, Genesis has top quality designer rings for under $2,000. It's not about the price. It's, it's about the craftsmanship and quality and detail and individuality. So don't compromise. Don't settle. Get her a world-class ring she'll be proud of. Genesis Diamonds are located in Green Hills and Cool Springs, also home to the state's largest selection of luxury pre-owned Rolexes.
Monday morning on Ramon, Kayla, and Will, RKW is brewed by 8th and Rose, 615-737-1045 is how you jump in. Ramon Foster, Robert Walsh, Will Bowling, Kayla Anderson with the morning off. We pose the question on Twitter and on the phone lines, what is the dumbest injury you had as a kid? And there are many of you patiently waiting to chime in. So we're going to get to your phone calls on this before we talk a little bit of Tennessee and Alabama hoops over the weekend. Let's start with Bryce in Hermitage first up. What's up, Bryce? What's up, Bryce? Hey, good morning, folks. Uh, dumbest thing I did was during high school, a couple weeks before football season started, before the regular season started, me and a buddy decided to go roll a fella's house and egg it. We didn't realize that it was a cop and that uh, he knew huh. my father. And so he come out the front door with a shotgun, firing his rock salt, and running between tree to tree, I got hit in the back of rock salt, and basically Pops told me we can do one or two things. I can take you to the hospital, and you'll have a criminal record, or I can uh, <sighs> dissolve it out. So I took the dissolving route. Let me tell you, Jack Daniels does not keep you numb long enough for that dissolve to go away. Wow. <laughs> Whoa. Hey, congratulations, man. You can say you got shot. Appreciate the call. I don't know if that's dumb or you just got lucky. That what is, a way to start. What a way to start. First, I mean, I, I'm taking the second route, too. Like, just just go ahead and get it out. I, I should have followed him up by asking, did he let you hit the Jack Daniels first? Too? <laughs> did, did did we miss that? Nolan in Nashville next, 615-737-1045. Hey, Nolan. Ramon, when, when you hit the kid's pocketbook for something stupid, it's called the dummy tax. <laughs> and unfortunately, uh, kids don't necessarily have a good uh, concept of money. So I like the, I, I, I like the route you're going. So my, my kid, right, travel ball player, uh, goes to school, goes on a seventh grade class trip, which is, you know, the week before travel ball starts. Of mm-hmm. course, that's all paid for. Uh, but laser tag, one rule, hey, no running, right? First thing they do, mm-hmm. run. Second thing they do is they see a railing. And the third thing they do is they try to jump over it. And then both their feet get caught up, or one of their feet get caught up, and they put their wrists down, and they break both their wrists. Oh. <laughs> uh, oh. And, and the, reason he, the reason he broke his wrist, the reason he put his wrist down, was the summer before that, he dove into a pool and snapped his teeth off. So, uh, you know, unfortunately, I'm paying that tax with teeth and braces. Uh, but, but yes, yeah, uh, stupid is stupid does. So you agree, hit their pockets when they got travel sports coming up, though. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, what, what, where I'm at is, uh, well, Ramon, so you got an older kid. We act, I've actually played against, uh, my kids, our kids play against each okay. other. But, you know, all this arm gear and the, and the, in the uh, the drip in the bag and the slide and pad the, and everything, oh man, the mitt. So like some of these kids go up to bat and think about it. They got four hundred dollars of protective gear yep. and they got a five hundred dollar bat and a two hundred dollar batting average. You know, <laughs> so it's like, uh, 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 but no, I, next to that, my my kid does not have batting gloves and uh, protective gear right now. So. Uh, that, that that that's the kid's pocketbook in my world is See? the drip. So Absolutely. You crush that drip, you crush dreams, son. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Nolan. <laughs> Appreciate the call. He is not li- – well, you got to come out one weekend. They oh, got, yeah. They well, got- I mean, all the rival parents of, of your son are, are celebrating in the streets <laughs> that he's on the shelf for six weeks. <laughs> Miles is a crazy rebounder, too. I ain't going to lie to you. And then he got middle school football coming up also. So he got some real repercussions that he's going to have to miss out on, man. Mm-hmm. But he ain't lying about the uh, baseball drip, the sleeve, oh, yeah. the slide mitt, the gloves. Oh, my gosh. Don't get me started on this bat. 615-737-1045. Joe and Laverne next. Hey, Joe. Good morning, guys. I love the show. Ramon, I'm going to start this off by saying I am a middle child. Uh Got a couple older sisters. When we were, I was in middle school, they were in high school. Dad got them some mace to put on their keychain so, you know, they could take care of themselves or whatever. And uh, I was instructed specifically, do not touch this stuff. So one day my sister came home from school, put her keys down on the table, 
I figured I'd give it a little squirt out the window, but it stuck to the screen. So I went to flick it off the screen with my finger, and right about the time the wind blew back in my face, I pretty much maced myself. <laughs> oh, no. oh, my gosh. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, lesson learned right there. Hey, us middle kids, man, we're going to learn the hard way. That's all, man. Guys, love the show. Thank you so much for uh, being a light and national every day. You guys, you guys all rock, man. We appreciate you, Joe. We appreciate you. <laughs> First and last time you've been maced. Man. Ugh. Have you ever have you ever smelt it, too? No. My cousin, my little cousin did the same thing. I sprayed it against the wall, and I didn't realize that stuff is orange coming out, I think. <laughs> Is it real? I don't want to find out. <laughs> oh my god! My grandpa had some in the back of his truck one time, and like the little, uh, the little side thing. Yeah. And I pulled that trigger in the truck. Windows rolled oh. up. But just I was just trying to touch it. I wasn't trying to spray it. And they got all in the truck, man. My grandpa wore my butt. <laughs> Out on, on the top side. of oh on the side of the road he was like holding me up by my belt <laughs> loops I couldn't go nowhere I was my arms and legs were dangling off the ground the ones where you're in public are the worst oh, <laughs> see I think those my brother thrives on those I think that's like his Samson getting beaten public is my brother's <laughs> like he will hulk up like that don't hurt you got to take him to a dark quiet basement to wear him out no. he, he he draws off the energy of other people man my brother. Oh man, he's wor- you think I'm bad? You, I am the shiniest washed turd compared to my brothers. But by, by the way, the wife texted me and said, "I love crush the drip th- uh, theory. <laughs> we will be yeah. crushing the drip now. You'll be out there, no gloves and a two to, uh, and a hundred dollar bat." Dustin Laverne is next. Six one five seven three seven one zero four five. Hey Dustin, what's up, Dustin? Good morning, guys. Um, I'm not super old, but I was born in 90. So, you know, we still had to print out maps and, uh, not a lot of people had internet and, uh, we were playing snake on our Nokia's and razors, you know, but, uh, there used to be this thing in the car. It was a cigarette lighter and it was a little circle cigarette lighter that you push in and it heats up. Yep. And if you were born before a certain year when they stopped doing that, I have to imagine that every single kid probably had to figure out about this thing. I knew it was hot, but I just didn't believe it until I, you know, experienced it for myself. So that, along with some other dumb stuff, but it's hard to say the worst one. So with uh, the cigarette know. lighter, did you get the tip of the finger? Or did you go middle of the hand? Oh, oh no, no, we went straight tip of the finger. You know, Ooh. where you burn off your fingerprint and all that and everything. So uh, yeah, and I, I remember that one being there for. I want to say it took like at least a month for that to heal on my finger because yep. it was burnt so bad. So. Um, but yeah, that's my my contender right there for sure. But we grew up with you know Jack A and CKY, so we were always doing stupid stuff back in the day. <laughs> Man, but, thank but, you, uh, Dustin. Appreciate thank the call. You, Dustin. <laughs> man, y'all been through some pain. Oh, the '90s set us up. Man. Y'all were hurt. They did. And you got to also think they they used to have like campaigns for. I'm gonna bring them up because they're not around. Like Camel cigarettes. They used to make yeah. the Camel cigarette dude look cool. Like, they, they tried to take us out, Will. I hate to tell you this. That dude was cool. They didn't have to try to make him look cool. All right. You ain't never seen nobody shoot pool like Joe Camel now. Matt and White House next. What's up, Matt? What's up, Matt? Hey, good morning, guys. Good morning. morning. This, uh, I remember I was 15 because this led to my first job. But where we went, they had basketball, it had weights, and it was connected to a gymnastics area. We've never done gymnastics today in my life, but all my friends thought it would be cool to go play on the gymnastics equipment at an open gym so first thing i do hop on the rings do a flip doesn't go so well second thing i do try it again end up leaving breaking my arm in a matter of minutes but we thought it'd be cool to try anyway remember i was 15 because it led to my first job teaching beginner gymnastics no joke (laughs) wow how how did you qualify thank you matt Let's get one more in uh, before we talk a little bit of Vols hoops. Let's Crazy. go to Zach in Mount Juliet next. Hey, Zach. What's up, Zach? Hey, guys. Big fan of the show here. Uh, one time played tennis at Charlie Daniels Park in Mount Juliet. Mm-hmm. Uh, played for about three, four hours and then rolled my ankle in the 10 yards walking in the grass after playing tennis in a snake hole or something like that. The plot twist is this wasn't as a child, this wasn't as a teenager, this was three and a half months ago, the 30-year-old man. <laughs> Zach, how's the recovery going? 
haven't played since. <laughs> <laughs> That'll teach you, right? <laughs> Thank you, Zach. <laughs> it's kind of like Bama stepped in a hole this weekend. Hey! <laughs> That's right. Bama stepped in a Tennessee defensive hole as uh, Bama had scored 90-plus points in six straight SEC games and couldn't even get to 80 over the weekend. Let's get to Eric in Nashville, though. We've got a regular on the line that will give the last word on uh, dumbest childhood injuries. What's up, Eric? What's up, Eric? Hey, guys. Uh, this happened back in the early 70s, around about 71, 72. I was about eight, nine years old. My father owned the skating rink at the fairground. So the dumbest thing I did was I went outside with the roller skate still on. So I was outside. It was near Granville, like park lot area, but there was a steep, I guess, hill or incline, whatever you want to call it. It was a bunch of trash. So I was turning around to go back in, and dummy me, I slipped and fell with the roller skates on, went down this hill. Huge piece of glass was stuck on the left side of my uh, knee. It was on the side, not, not in the knee, but I still am looking at it now. I had to have it removed and had stitches and a wrap on my uh, leg, and I still have the scars from that day for the rest of my life because of that dumb thing I did. Guys, y'all take care. We'll talk to you soon. Oof. That's crazy. Thank you, Eric. I hate to hear that, but I would love to see Eric going down a hill <laughs> on some rollerblades. Me too. I hate to say it, but you know he gets some speed, man. <laughs> you know what I walked away from that conversation Eric just gave us? Eric got scars older than me. <laughs> Well, I think uh, anyone that was in Coleman Coliseum wearing crimson has got some scars from what Zakai Ziegler and the Vols did to Alabama on Saturday with 14-27 left, Ramon Foster. Yeah. Sam Walters for Alabama hit a layup to put Alabama up 56-51. to From that point onwards, Alabama went 3-for-23 from the floor, and one of those was an uncontested layup with seven seconds left in the game. For 14 minutes... Alabama made two shots outside of free throws. Defense, 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 man. That's the reason Dalton connects at Tennessee right now is because of defense. And you got to give it up for Jemai Meshack. I mean, golly, what what did he go through as a child to play defense like that? Honestly. No, for real, man. This dude was out there basically playing safety. That right there was a huge turnaround in the game, too. Uh, whenever he ended up intercepting that ball right across half court and tipped it back in to um, – Zakai, all in all, good game. Somebody had to step up. They did everything they possibly could, man, to take away uh, Dalton Connect. And and they did for the most part for a game that he was expected to have a big numbers in. Um, you got to give it to him. And, and not just that, man. The other side of it for me is is we speak about teams having premier players, right? A, a caliber players, like A1 players. And whenever they whenever they get taken away from you, what can your team actually do? And the team actually rose up again, having um, Adu in foul trouble earlier, uh, a Toby Walker also in foul trouble earlier, and still be able to make it happen throughout the course of the game. I, I think speaks a lot about Rick Barnes, man. I think it does a lot for his legacy, uh, and also just the, the 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 route that this team is on so far. Will like it's been numerous times where players have gotten shot out, shut out. And they still rise up and win. I'm I'm impressed by what happened. And this one was an SEC game on the road. Didn't it feel like this was the recipe for Tennessee to lose at the NCAA tournament? Facts. In two different ways. Dalton Connect gets in foul trouble and the big guys get in foul trouble. So those two elements were one aspect of this. The second one is Dalton Connect not scoring 20 plus points. That to me was what scares me about this basketball team is, are they going to go up against a team that gets Dalton and fluke foul trouble because you've got refs that haven't seen him play that maybe are calling the game more differently than the regional refs that you see more often in the SEC. Not that there are conference affiliations anymore with officials, but is there just a one-off game where he gets in foul trouble and you're done for? If you can win in Tuscaloosa with Dalton connect in foul trouble, you can beat a four seed in the sweet 16 with a chance to get to the Elite Eight with Dalton Connect in foul trouble. No doubt about it, man. And it was good to see. And to that point, though, I think we saw what Ron Slay always talks about. I think both sides were playing, playing aggressive. I think they were in the bonus before the the 14 to 12-minute mark was in the game in the first half. Like, they were getting after They called it, I thought, fair. The fouls was as even as you can get. But Ron said, what to us? He said, oh, well, Savage. Savage said, what to us, right? He was like, you can't call every single foul if both teams is doing it like this. And, of course, you got to give it up to Alabama. They also played aggressive. They were on our guys. We returned the favor back to them. And I, I somewhat got to give it up. Pat Adams was on the call, wasn't he? 
His Unfortunately, crew, he was. His crew, I thought, was pretty fair. I did. When you look at it and how it broke down, you can't say that one side went to the other. What I didn't hate is what I saw from one of your tweets. What I did hate was one of your tweets. It was the delayed foul to watch if the ball was going to go in. That was too obvious to me. There were there was one before the first media timeout where it was Jonas Adu's first foul, I believe, and Pat Adams waited for the shot to go off the rim to then blow the whistle. That is my number one pet peeve in college basketball is when a ref watches a shot and then waits to call a foul if the shot doesn't go in, and then he blows his whistle. Yeah. My number one pet peeve. I saw that, but I, I I will say I think both sides had a benefit of that too. I don't like it for either side because it's like, why, why are we waiting? Just call it if it's there. You know, don't wait for the and one or, hey, you fouled him too hard, so he missed it call. Like, don't do that. My, my biggest appreciation for this weekend and that game, no will, is, is, is a four-letter word, man. Hate. <laughs> I ain't even mad at it. We're supposed to hate them. They're supposed to hate us, y'all. Like, I, I, this ain't even no anti-Alabama thing right here. I enjoyed watching their their uh, commentators on the, on the, on the court just, just be in disgust whenever they were missing balls. and st- I was just like, yes, more of that in sports, man. Like, be passionate about these wins and losses, man. I absolutely loved it. The stuff that I saw on social media is a part of it. Kentucky fans saying, y'all should thank us. We broke them. I love that, too. We need this in sports, especially as competitive as the SEC is about to get. It was funny watching the crowd. They kept panning to the <laughs> students and panning to these idiots wearing hard hats in the Alabama student section and genuinely the hate on their faces whenever Tennessee would do anything. I had the exact same thought. You could really tell just how badly that fan base wanted to win. And I think it's because that is also like Tennessee, a fan base that treats wins and losses in basketball, like football games. And Slade tells us all the time. If you can be a great team, you're going to lose a lot. Kind of like an NFL team. You're going to lose a lot and still have a chance to win a championship. And Tennessee's lost a decent amount this year and has a very good chance. Maybe it's best chance in program history of winning a championship. But you can't treat every win and loss like you've got eternal bragging rights for the next 364 days over the school you're playing. However, I think Tennessee and Alabama fans really do come at it from that direction. Yeah, I think so. That's why we freak out a little too much on losses and we probably celebrate the wins a little too much too. We do the 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 social media account for, for balls basketball afterwards is like well it's not a single one yeah we we don't we don't Ramon, give can you a, tell me the, the the dams that we give about the whole state of Alabama not, not a single one <laughs> <laughs> I won't give a damn about the whole state of Alabama that's what it's about man and the same thing goes when they get us this is why it means more in the fall like say what you want to. Like and I've heard I've had this hard conversation with a lot of people. It's like you guys aren't Alabama's rivalry. That crowd can tell me that on Saturday. Yeah, no, it's the, it's definitely Alabama's rivalry. Guys, I took a loss like Alabama too this week. No. Did you? I learned that I am not Tennessee's favorite Bert. I was listening to the game on 104.5 The Zern, <laughs> the, the Zern, and Bert Bertle Camp. Oh, he's a king, are isn't you he? kidding me? <laughs> he is actually Money. Bert Bert. He is actually Bert Bert. Someone has taken my my name, my nickname, my lineage, anything that I hold dear. Bert Bert over there in Tennessee took everything. Didn't nobody tell me about old Bertle Camp? See, I think what's happened is that that's always been Bert's least favorite nickname for himself, and now this is his excuse to get rid of it. <laughs> it belongs to him. He, he, he is Bert Bert. We'll have he to let Kayla lie. know before she gets back. 615-737-1045 is our number. More reaction to the weekend where one Titans target, according to an NFL.com analyst, had a bad weekend in Indy. We'll talk about it next. Fellas, if you've been feeling tired and grumpy, have you noticed a lack of motivation and drive? You may have low T, okay? Low testosterone levels can cause weight gain, loss of muscle mass, and so much more. 
I recommend to your low T center. That's why I get my levels tested. They make it quick and easy uh, to get your levels checked, and it's only $25 too. And with their on site lab, you'll get results back in about 25 minutes. Most insurance is accepted for treatment also. So go to lowtcenter.com now to book your appointment online. Again, low T center, reinventing men's health care.
Monday morning, kick it off the new week on Ramon, Kayla, and Will. RKW is brewed by 8th and Rose. Coming up in 15 minutes, analysts are split on Tennessee's case for a number one seed. We'll talk about that coming up in just a few. 615-737-1045 is how you join us. Guys, we learned over the weekend that we have been mispronouncing the name of a Titans offensive line prospect all draft season. Did you guys see this? Missed it, Will. Olu Fashanu. <laughs> it is not Fashanu. Mm-hmm. Olu Fashanu. Mm. Robert Walsh looks like I just told him that his dog died. You a little let down by that? Because I, I am a little bit. I feel like we're meeting a new person now. Olu Fashanu. Fashanu sounds like a Star Wars character. Like Fashanu sounds like a badass offensive lineman. <laughs> I don't even want that cat anymore. <laughs> Let him go to the Steelers, bro. When he makes <laughs> a good first season, when he, when he has a good play, it's it's Fashanu. And then when he messes up and gives up a sack, it's Fashanu. That's your son. That's not my son. <laughs> <laughs> like when Jarrett Garantano would throw a pick, he was Garantano again. But then when he would play well, we're like, all right, good job, Garantano. Fashionu. Proud of you. That's, that's new to me. Is this like Vescovy Vescovy? Yes, it is. It's 100% the same thing. He was like, yeah, I hear, I've heard a lot of you butcher my last name, <laughs> is what he said. Me? Analysts uh, think that he had a bad weekend, yeah, Ramon. Yeah. So uh, NFL.com writer uh, Chad Reuter writes, I believe Fashionu, that's still going to take some getting used to, needed a strong combine to ensure a top 10 selection. Unfortunately, his day ended with a right thigh injury after his first 40-yard dash run of 5.11 seconds, a 10-yard split of 177. The hand size is what has people concerned. Welcome to the silly season, boys and girls. His hand size measured 8.5 inches, which is unusually small for a tackle prospect. How much do you care about hand size, Ramon Foster, in a tackle prospect? Why does hand size matter when it comes down to uh, offensive line play? I can, I can get it. Here's the thing. You want big, powerful mitts, right, punching guys. Like, I looked at my my I had, like, 10-inch hands, I think is what it was. So can you imagine smaller hands than mine, Will? Like, I guess that is kind of small. Um, maybe that's grip. Maybe that's the uh, idea that, hey, he'll lose guys because maybe his wrist or <laughs> or weak or something like that. Like, small hands, I thought, only matter for people that were catching or throwing the football. I didn't know that was a thing as far as offensive line play goes. And I got to ask Coach Mack about that one. I ain't ever just really heard of an offensive lineman having small hands, unless we were going to talk about a center or something like that. The 5-1-1 can be somewhat disappointing, but his split was a 1-7-7, though. So I, I'm not opposed to it. I, I can understand it. Over 30 on his vertical, I thought he moved well. On his jumps, he was good. 32-inch vertical, 9-foot-1 broad jump. But now his pro day becomes a little bit more important as his thigh injury. He had a big ice pack around his thigh yesterday after his first run. Uh, And he said he, he felt fine, but hopefully was going to be available for Penn State's pro day that's in about a week and a half. Uh, oh, sorry, Moan. Uh, Darnell Wright last year had sub nine inch hands and went in the first round, started 17 games for the Chicago Bears. So take that for what you will. Uh-huh. This is the, the point of the year where they, they, they start to knock and find any little thing. You got to realize, of course, we talked about this. It's either that you're going up or you're moving down at this time of the day. I mean, this time of the year as far as the draft and combine goes. The other offensive lineman who uh, stock is down, according to NFL.com, is Georgia center Cedric Van Pran, who measured at 31 and 3 eighths inches arms, shorter arms, smaller wingspan at 78 and 5 eighths inches, and weighed in less than 300 pounds as well at 298 pounds, 5240 for the Georgia center. Yeah, I saw that. Um, I looked up a comparable Marquise, I think, ran a five two five also. So that that that, that Marquise pouncing Marquise with the Steelers pouncing, yeah, for those who saying. are unfamiliar. Yeah, he ran a five two five, I think forty also, and he was under three hundred pounds at the time too. Again, you're looking at their ten yard split for the most part. I'm not sure if he did um the bench or anything like that, but the dude can play. I think when you're drafting a guy like him, can he or can he not play? Um, it's fascinating. I think they have him as uh, looking at the prospect grade also on NFL.com. 
they have him as a will eventually be an average starter. So what are you looking for? Probably a second round guy, needs some growth, uh, probably going to get beat up in his first year, just like most rookies are and stuff like that. Uh, I, I didn't realize center's arms were that long anyway. It never was a thing because you can't tell me, Travis. I mean, uh, Jason Kelsey has very long arms at center, you know, especially depending upon which technique you use and everything. 615-737-1045 is our number and streaming live on 104.5 The Zone TV, Facebook Live, YouTube, Twitter, or Twitch. Twitch, Twitch, please. Coming up, we begin our number two of the show where analysts are split. Is Tennessee a one seed after winning in Tuscaloosa? We'll give you our reaction next. It's Ramon Foster, Hill of Plumbing, Heating, Cooling, and Electrical. Y'all, we're in the month of March right now, and this month is Happy Hiller Golden Ticket Sweepstake, okay? You can enter to win at HillerGoldenTicket.com. All you have to do is enter your email, and you'll automatically enter to win, okay? Prizes include a $5,000 Hiller gift card. You can also get a $1,000 Hiller gift card or one of the 10 Happy Hiller Club memberships, which come in clutch. I promise you that anytime something's done, they're going to come to your crib and get it done. Or you can also take advantage of that zero interest financing for 48 months on a select new HVAC system or 36 months on a tankless water heater and whole home generators. Don't miss out again, okay? Enter to win now at HillerGoldenTicket.com.
What's going on? 7 o'clock. Good morning from the 104.5 The Zone Studios. I am Robert Walsh. Record-setting performances all weekend long at the Combine. Not only did Texas wide receiver Xavier Worthy break the 40 record with his 4-2-1. On his second run, nine wide receivers ran a sub-440, the most in Combine history. But wide receivers weren't the only position putting on a show as offensive line had a day on Sunday. Today they do their bench press if you missed that. Uh, you're wondering why they didn't bench press yet. They hadn't done it. That happens today. Joe Alt, Amarius Mims, Olu, Fashino, Fashionu. We'll figure that out. Tyler Guyton, uh, Talisi Fuaga, all posted top 100 athletic scores out of tackles who have worked out at the Combine since 1987. And in free agency news, the Bills will release running back Naheem Hines, clearing $4.6 million in salary cap space. Hines missed last season due to a non-football season-ending injury. And the Bills sent a conditional six-round pick and Zach Moss for Hines in 2022. For your foundation repair and waterproofing needs, visit USSTN.com. Breaking news once on your home for the Titans and the Vols. This is 104.5 The Zone. Monday morning starts right now on Ramon, Kayla, and Will. RKW is brewed by 8th and Rose, cultivated in community by The Cup. Locally owned and operated by lifelong friends turned business partners who design local 8th and Rose shops as a way to feel welcomed, connected, and part of a community. Stop by and see them and grab a cup of 8th and Rose coffee on 8th Avenue, Charlotte, the airport, or the Broadview at Vanderbilt as you start your week this morning 615-737-1045 is how you jump in coming up in 20 minutes who's your biggest draft crush i've got two on offense and two on defense for the people a very impressive weekend for the 2024 draft class that does continue today as robert walsh just told you with the offensive lineman on the bench press we'll continue to react to all of that as things happen this morning as well. With Ramon Foster, Robert Walsh, our producer, Kayla Anderson with the morning off. I'm Will Bowling, streaming live at 104.5 The Zone TV. And Tennessee gets it done in Tuscaloosa, taking their brooms down to Alabama and picking up a win after Alabama students told us Dalton Connect was overrated they did. during college game day. They did chant that. They chanted it loud, too. And it looked like they were at least preparing for a big dub, too. Did you see their pregame? That <laughs> is one of the funniest things that has happened in a long time. So if you missed it, Alabama security staff practiced preventing storming the court before the game. There's video of this, of the buzzer sounding and all the yellow jackets just descending on the court and having a rope that they pull up right in front of the bench. The good thing is Tennessee also practiced all week to prevent a court storming at Tuscaloosa, and Tennessee successfully prevented a court storming. So thank you, Rick Barnes and the Vols, for keeping all those Alabama players safe and secure. I am told sometimes that when there is a field or court storming, sometimes players actually reach out and hit some of those students. That I, I don't know where that happened, but I'm told that has happened before. Uh, oh, no, it happened in Knoxville yeah. between Tennessee and Alabama last year. Duh. Yeah. I say with the utmost sarcasm. But, yes, Tennessee uh, does a very good job preventing a court storming in Tuscaloosa on Saturday. Absolutely, man. Uh, I thought it was I thought it was funny, but, of course, it's somewhat necessary to have that type of stuff happening. Um, but, of course, again, you, you look at how big that game was. College game day, a night game at their place. I think they had a whiteout as far as their uh, their fans went and stuff like that. They The hate was real, and I appreciated it, too. You want to talk about yelling at the TV screen on Saturday, like I legitimately going at it, man. But it was a good play game. Tennessee dealt with a lot of ups and downs in that game. They dealt with foul trouble. They dealt with Dalton Connect not being able to catch his his stride in it. And the biggest thing, man, as sometimes bad stuff happens, you know, like and you hate it. 
You hate that you're injured. You hate that you have a situation that you didn't plan on happening in your sports career or just in life in general, right? That's one thing I always try to say. It's good for kids to play sports. It's good for kids to go through, like, bad situation in sports, too, because it, it creates a monster if you treat it right. You get hungry from it. And I think we're seeing that right now from Zakai Ziegler. I don't think we get – we don't win this game, I don't think, as a team. I say we like I'm on the team with, with them, okay? The Vols don't win this team, win this game if Zakai Ziegler can't shoot the ball. Zakai shot the three well because that's one of the things he wanted to do in his rehabbing as far as coming back from his ACL injury. Just because you have a bad thing happen in your life doesn't mean it should define you. And I'm glad to see Zakai come back stronger than ever and also with a better tool this time around too. He's got a three-point shot. Look at the shots that he was taking and made this past weekend. He didn't do this last year. It wasn't as fluid as it is this year. That's why I always say there's not a bad moment that happens. It's just a, a break in your process. And in that process of getting back to what you want to do, you get better at something else. And for him, it was his three-point shot. Jemai Meshack played 27 minutes and may have played his best game as of all on Saturday, scoring eight points with six rebounds, four assists, a huge steal after he made a corner three that set up a Zakai Ziegler assist to Jonas Adu and and one that would give Tennessee a late lead in this game. And we talked about it earlier, Ramon. This is the kind of game that has scared us about this Tennessee team. What would happen if Dalton Connect is in foul trouble? And what would happen if he doesn't score 25 points and can't save you offensively late in the game? Tennessee survived a three for 23 shooting stretch and a 17 to one Alabama run by holding Alabama to three for 23 from the field over the final 14 minutes of the game. Crazy. Uh, who, who's to think that as offensive as that team is? That's the only thing that, that, that you hear about them is, yeah, you can go play with them, but they're going to outscore you. And that's why they had been, what they had been doing. What was it, 192 points in like two games they had before this one? Like they can ring it up in this show too. You got to give it up also for uh, Mark Sears. He's solid. You got to give it to him. And you you mentioned that uncontested uh, layup at the end of the game. I was thinking that that was one of those petty shots. And I know he needed to take the shot to help his team win. But it was one of those shots you're just like, well, that just helps his average right there. You know what I'm saying? I would have thought in any other situation, a guy would have taken a three. But he took the two, and the, the clock was pretty much ran out at that point. And all I was thinking is that is to help his average for the conversation of player of the year and all those types of things like that. So he's averaging 20.7. I think Dalton may have taken a hit this weekend. I ain't sure right now. Dalton coming into the game, I believe, was 20.8. He was. So they were essentially identical. Going into Saturday's game, Alabama had scored 90-plus points in six straight SEC games. They had scored 80-plus points in nine straight conference games. And now their two lowest scoring totals of the season, 71 points and 74 points, have come against Tennessee. Great defense, man. Sure but was. you got to also have a team that's capable of doing that. Like, you can't just roll it out and decide to play physical. That's one thing that Tennessee was able to do, too, is somewhat go to the bench with Toby and Ganey and Mayshack playing a, a good bulk of the business this past weekend. I mean, you look at the breakdown of the five that played the bulk of it. Adu played 23 minutes. Connect played 28. Zakai, 38. Can you imagine if they got a GPS on him, how much he's running? Oh, I know. Throughout the course of the game. Like, he's running a lot, but he played 38 minutes. Vescovy, 26. Josiah Jordan James, 33. And Mayshack. And a role playing 27 minutes, and each one of those minutes was crucial because he defended well around the perimeter, man. And not just that, at the glass, too. He did his thing when it came down to you watching a guy that's in a role that had to take a back seat because of Dalton Connect or because you had uh, Josiah Jordan James and, and, and Vescovy come back. Like, he didn't, he's not complaining about the circumstance. He's leaning into it. I've heard Savage say this before. And others have talked about this, too. I think we've had Austin Price only speak about him and also Brent Hubbs. Like, he is the, the heartbeat of that team, and it shows. And it shows because of his production and him doing, like, the small things that you don't expect a guy like him to do. Like, he locked down Sears and those guys around the perimeter at a good rate that gave them the ability to get a turnover, have the ability to just get the ball back in, 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 in tight situation. That interception at the uh, half, at half court. 
I thought it was by far one of the biggest plays of the game. Surely. Absolutely. Grant Ramey of VolQuest puts this on Twitter yesterday about Tennessee versus Arizona in the last race for the fourth one seed. Tennessee is six and five in quad one games. Arizona is eight and three. In quad two games, Arizona has two losses. Tennessee only has one. Vols are six and one in quad two games. Arizona five and two in quad two games. In quad three, Tennessee is six and zero. Oh. Arizona's eight and one. They have a Q three loss this season. And in quad four, Tennessee and Arizona each undefeated. Analysts are split on whether or not Tennessee is a number one seed at this point. So right now, ESPN's Joe Lenardi wrote on Saturday night, Tennessee cannot get a one seed with a win at Alabama, but a one seed remains on the table for the Vols with a win in Tuscaloosa. In recent weeks, Lenardi has flipped Tennessee between the number five and number six overall seed with right now, Tennessee being the number five overall seed and number two with Houston in the South region. You have advantageous regional matchups with that. You'd be able to play in a city that is easier to travel earlier on in the process. You'd get a Houston team uh, within that. But Jerry Palm of CBS Sports does have Tennessee with a number one seed, but in the West region. So in that Arizona would be the fifth overall team. And so you would be put with Arizona as your two seed and you would be in the West. So that could get difficult. It's almost better in some ways to be in the South and be where regionally you can have more fans Mm -hmm. and play Houston versus you're a one seed. Yes. You might have an easier path to the elite eight, but you've got a second seeded Arizona right there. Who's got more of a home court advantage in the West region if you were paired up with them. Right. And their their last two games of the season, too, is at UCLA and at USC also. Just to give it. And ours is uh, at South Carolina, then home against Kentucky. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. At UCLA and at USC, not super difficult. Nah. Those teams have not been good this year. Yeah. And they, they've, they've had a, a few, of course. We both lost to Purdue. They lost Purdue also. Uh, Florida Atlantic got them. Mm, the no, Florida Atlantic's good. Yeah. Really see? good. And uh, they got swept by Washington State two times this year. That is one of their quad two losses, one of Arizona's worst losses in that one. So that is the team that would have to lose for Tennessee to move up. They have won nine of their last ten and have an average margin of victory of 18 points per game over their last three. Mm. 615-737-1045 is our number. Who is your draft crush? Was there somebody you watched the NFL Combine over the weekend and thought to yourself, I need that guy to be a Tennessee Titan? I've got two options for you on offense, two on defense. We can take your thoughts as well at 615-737-1045. Next on Ramon, Kayla, and Will. Hey, it's Will Bowling here for my friends at Lee Company. Hey, do you have a ceiling light fixture that flickers? Do you need an extra outlet or two? Or do you have wall switches that just don't seem to work the way they're supposed to? Well, these all seem to be simple issues. However, they are rarely do-it-yourself projects. I know personally when I try to do it myself and fix things the way I think they're supposed to be fixed, I typically just make it worse. Dealing with electricity requires the expertise of an experienced professional. You got to call the pros over at Lee Company. Their electrical team can solve any problem you have safely, and they're going to do it efficiently as well. And right now, you can enjoy $20 off an electrical service call for a limited time. Just remember this phone number, 615-567-1000, or go to their website, leecompany.com for an appointment. That's $20 off an electrical service call for a limited time at Lee Company. 615-567-1000 that are online at LeeCompany.com. That's Lee Company. All you need.
Monday morning, kick it off a brand new week. Connor Bone, Kayla, and Will RKW is brewed by Eighth and Rose. Ramon Foster, Robert Walsh, Will Bowling with you. 615-737-1045. Who is your draft crush? We all have them. We all love them. Who is the one guy that, despite all logic and despite where the Titans are picking, the one guy that you just need to be a Tennessee Titan? 615 737 1045 is our number. We will get back to Vols Hoops discussion at 820 this morning when our good friend Mike Wilson stops by. Ramon, I imagine that your draft crush is a big man. Uh, you can be surprised. Okay. Absolutely not, man. So we both got a couple of these and can run through them, but start with your number one player you are crushing on in the draft process. We've talked about them before. Um, but it's hard not to like Braden Fisk, the D tackle out of uh, Florida State from Western Michigan. Uh, he he lived up to expectations. No, he exceeded expectations. I think people thought that he just tested okay, but it 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 really gives uh it really backs up my my thoughts and watching him at the Senior Bowl and asking Coach Mack, Coach Mack, why does this guy keep showing up in the backfield? Coach Mack, he's winning again. Coach Mack, he's messing up the drill again. Coach, he's like Ramon. <laughs> you might have to believe what he's doing right now. And that's because I hadn't heard of him like that. And you're trying to figure out, is he capable of doing these things? And uh, he's not super huge, but he's, I'm talking about very productive when it comes down to it. And his measurements and everything this weekend backed up everything that you could have thought about a guy like him. He had a phenomenal um, combine. He backed up, I think, the fastest D D lineman also that ran Mm -hmm. this weekend also. Yep. Uh, absolutely crushed it. But we've talked about him before. Um, but I have a, a couple other guys too. We going through them? Sure. Uh, Isaac Gar- Garendendo. What? How do you say? Isaac Garendo. Garendo. Yep. His numbers, at least as far as the combine, were friggin' insane. If you're looking for a bruising back, that's him. He's listed at six foot two twenty one. At two six foot two twenty one, he ran a four three three forty. Also had a four uh forty one and a half inch vertical out of Louisville, right up the street. You at least got to bring him in. If you're going to use Tajay as your premier back, premier back, you have a guy like him, Isaac Garendo, out of Louisville, four three three forty at two hundred and twenty pounds, at six foot tall. Um, another guy I loved also was Ricky Pearsall. I had no idea I was going to look at Ricky Pearsall and he was going to run a four four one. Florida wide receiver. Florida wide receiver. Uh, not just that, two forty two inch vertical and ten nine broad jump. Ricky Pearsall showed up on the stat line, and here's the other thing too: it's not just his testing. At the Senior Bowl, he was able to separate and move up and down the field. He can play. And then the last one, man, is a D line because I've been howling this for the Titans, man. Uh, Rook Arojo Rojo. Oh yes, Hello? that is his name. That's <laughs> Are you, are you just, all you got to do is say it three times. Arororo. Arororo. That's his name. Like Rook a dog bark. Arororo. It tripped me out, so I had to go hear how it was said. <laughs> <laughs> Rook Arororo. Um, here's the thing. Ran a 48740, 32-inch vert- vertical. He's also 6'4", 294. A lot of people say he's very raw. Um, he has, he get distracted. And one of the things I read as far as like picking little battles just needs to keep the main thing, the main thing. But he's a younger dude out of Clemson. They expected a lot out of him in his early years. If I'm not mistaken, he's coming out as a young guy, too. Um, But he can move, can get up field. If you're looking for an attacking, uh, uh, hard nose type of D tackle, Ruka Roro is your guy. All right, so let's go back to Braden Fisk. Let's dive into these individually uh, a bit more specifically. At six foot four, two hundred ninety-two pounds, Braden Fisk, Florida State defensive tackle, ran a four seven eight forty yard dash. That is right around what All Pro wide receiver Anquan Bolden ran as a wide receiver. It's not far from what Jawan Jennings ran as a wide receiver. And this guy is six foot four, two hundred ninety-two pounds. His ten yard split was one six nine. That is near the ninety-third percentile. He also logged a 33-and-a-half-inch vertical and a 9-foot-9 nine nine broad jump. Those were both position bests for defensive tackles. His 4-3-7 short shuttle time, which Kentley Platty over the weekend on Friday told us is the most important number for big guys, specifically in the offensive line, and this is a defensive lineman, but specifically for linemen is the number that is most valuable. 4-3-7 short shuttle time. That is two hundredths of a second better than Aaron Donald. 
That's who Mac brought up and we uh, spoke about him. Not to say that he is him, but the the idea you don't know who he is or where he fits. And here's the thing about him. That 168 is why he's in the backfield, that 10-yard split right there. Do you want a guy that's going to get to the back uh, back of the uh, line of scrimmage? He's your guy. Here's other things you might have to deal with with a guy like him too. Narrow hips for the most part, so he might get pushed around in the run game. But when you have a guy like him in your rotation, the idea that he's going to disrupt, the idea that he's going to be a guy that causes problems for opposing offensive lines and you know there's going to be production and a pass rush there, he checks every single box, Will. Aaron on Twitter. Says at Ramon Kayla Will, Roma Dunze is my draft crush. Sending us a tweet that says, Most of the top 10 wimped out and didn't participate at the combine. He went the extra mile. Speed, size, hands, resume, and a likable dude with a great attitude. Just don't let him get on your plane. Make him a Titan. Roma Dunze was the one who was asked, for whatever reason, on Friday morning, could you land a plane in an emergency? <laughs> And he said, no, I honestly, I've seen a lot of people say this on Twitter. I need my wide receiver to have an unhealthy level of self-confidence. That honestly might be a red flag for <laughs> Roma Dunze. Tell me you can land a plane in the Hudson. Tell me you can land a plane in the desert and do whatever you need to do. 100%. I think a Dunze, though, is going to be a common pick. How much did he help himself by going through everything? This weekend? A good bit. That way he also, this second time around, as far as his pro day goes, he can just relax. He can just run routes. He ain't got to do anything else, Will. And that also uh, creates less less opportunities for injuries and stuff like that. And you know he's going to do well at his, at his uh, pro day because he's going to have his quarterback there for him also. I think he showed that I can go whenever you need me to. I'm a grinder. He's probably going to go to a team that that has that type of mentality, just go get the job done. And, again, as high as he's going to go uh, get picked, he's probably going to go to a bad team. Mm-hmm. So because of that, his work ethic is probably going to be something they lean on moving forward if you need help at the wide receiver position. So here is my first draft crush, and I cannot believe I'm saying this. Because I irrationally hated this player in college. When this player got open against Tennessee, it made you angry. Because when a little guy named Lad McConkey is able to beat your defensive back in space, and you use all the white guy cliches to talk about him. He's sneaky fast. He's a real gym rat. Coach's son. First in, last out kind of guy. He's got deceptive speed. Uh, there's nothing deceptive, Ramon Foster, about a 4 3 9 40 and a 1 5 2 10 yard split. I see Lad McConkey and I see Puka Nakua. I want that. I want a guy in the slot who can get open quickly, who can win right at the line of scrimmage, and who can be a speedster for me in the slot with his deceptive quickness because he's a white dude that plays slot receiver. The question I asked to you, Ramon Foster, is how big are the Titans' needs at slot receiver specifically, knowing you have Kyle Phillips and now you have a head coach that might be able to get more out of Kyle Phillips? Are you interested in a Lad McConkey kind of receiver for the Tennessee Titans? I can. I think they're still looking. The fact that we haven't seen Kyle Phillips on the field consistently that becomes bothersome. Again, you either getting better or you getting moved on from. That's the way the NFL works. This isn't a, hey, I'm sorry you feel this way type of league. This is a, hey, we need you so we can win. And I think Kyle Phillips is somewhat capable of this type of stuff as far as being a playmaker in the slot. You can't keep him out there long enough, though, Will. And again, Brian Callahan did not pick Kyle Phillips. We have to also remember that type of stuff. You want your type of guy. You want your own guy inside of your building that you know is going to be the cause and effects of you of you winning. That's where a guy to me, and I was in the same boat as you, I text you guys. I did not have 439 on my Lad McConkey bingo card. The speed. But then you go back and, as Bert said, going back and looking at his tape, the thing that's most interesting about him too is his ability to find the open spot. I'm going to say this, and it's not the exact same thing. It's just the technique is good. The way he finds the middle of the defense is very Travis Kelsey-esque. You know what I'm saying? Like, he will, and, and you see him doing all the little tricks of the trade, using his elbow to get him off of him to create space. He finds a place to sit down in the offense to be able to catch the ball. And the best thing about him is that one five two split. You know what that means? He can catch the ball and go. Right. 
And and that's what this offense needs a little bit more of, too. Kidding a guy, and we've heard Rand said, we've heard Brian Callahan. We even heard Vrabel say, we gotta get we gotta get speed. I don't I don't know what Lad McConkey's special team's ability is, but the idea that he can be a weapon for you is I'm 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 with you on the Puka Nakua conversation. A guy that just starts eating up yards and creating an offense for you, you didn't know what's there. And I think that is an important part of what the Titans need is someone who can get open over the middle of the field quickly. And when I hear Brian Callahan talk about what he wants out of the wide receiver position, I think of a guy like Lad McConkey who's going to get open and do it fast. He was George's punt returner in 2022, had 16 returns for 197 yards and a long of 39 yards. He had one kickoff return for Georgia in 2023 and returned punts sparingly in 21 and really as the main guy, I believe, in 2022. Yeah. Uh, he was legit this weekend. The, the the numbers don't mean everything. It just solidifies. It just gives a storyline to what you think about guys. I was I'm highly impressed by him. It explains why he was so open in college. <laughs> That's very true. And because with that offensive line at Georgia, there's a reason why guys are always so open. Peyton Wilson is my number two draft crush, Ramon Foster. Linebacker out of NC State. 6'3 and 7'8, 233 pounds. Ran a 4'4, 440. Mm. And then a 4'4, 9 on his second attempt. He stuffed the stat sheet in his last season at NC State in 2023 that saw him win the Chuck Bidnarik Award for the top defensive player in college football. Won the Buckus Award as well for top linebacker in addition to being named ACC Defensive Player of the Year with 138 tackles, 17 and a half tackles for loss, six sacks, three interceptions, a pick six, two forced fumbles, and one fumble recovery in 12 games last season with NC State. The medicals are the problem with Peyton Wilson. Knee and shoulder issues that cost him a lot of time at NC State. He also had some of the shortest arms among linebacker prospects at NC state at 30 and a half inches, but I do not care. Ramon, when you played against good inside linebackers, yeah. what made a great inside linebacker that made it difficult on you as a lineman to play against the ability to thump and shred, meaning hit you and get off to find the ball that right there, I think is the most problematic for the interior guys that and the ability to scrape over a uh, defensive lineman to make a tackle. Um, the guys that were, had good vision is, is what I'm basically saying. If you can square up an offensive lineman and get off to go make a tackle in the hole, you've done your job. You've also minimized the heck out of the offensive line, knowing that, look, this dude can beat me at any point in time. For dudes like him, they have to be good side to side. And you know where you see that at? And his 40, the 4-4-3, and also the 1-5 split for a dude like him. And, and, and I know a lot of people are wondering, you know, what is the vertical jump for? It shows the explosion. It shows this guy possibly have good hips. It shows the ability that this guy is, is fluid in his hips, too. And that's what you see out of a dude like him. It will be fascinating to see where he goes. The arms, to me, mean a lot. But you also got to think this guy plays a position that's very physical and plays it in a physical way, too. Especially with him being ACC Defensive Player of the Year. That's not an easy task. That division is still pretty good. Or that conference is still pretty good defensively and always sends guys out. I, I like to know that type of stuff, though, too, because when, when you're telling me that he beat out the likes of Clemson, he beat out people from Florida State who had a monster defense this year, too. I mean, Clemson DB Nate Wiggins is I'm, right there. Legitimately. So yeah. you know he can play ball. I love the idea that, look, we can knock him for his arms or he's got nine-inch hands or something like that. But this this dude is 6'4", 233. He's not a little guy. Well, how tall are you, 6'3"? 6'2". Two. Six 6'2". Two. I mean, he's taller than you. Think yeah. about this dude across the middle. So, and the fact that he's running a 4'4 on top of it. Thing that I do want to say, and I got to go look at this tape too, does this 4'4 translate over? And clearly it does because ACC Defensive Player of the Year. Right. There was one video that was circulating on Twitter over the weekend. I want to say it was against Clemson where he chased down a wide receiver from behind to make a tackle Ooh. on a completed pass over the middle. I think if the medicals check out on him, he has got an outstanding career ahead of him. But the medicals are the problem with Peyton Wilson. Let's talk about Max Melton, Ramon Foster, cornerback yeah, yeah. out of Rutgers, who scored a 9.65 relative athletic score. 
corner in the 2024 draft class, ranked 79 out of over 2,000 corners from 1987 to 2024. 439 40 yard dash, 40 and a half inch vertical, 11 foot four broad jump. That is flying. Ah. For the Rutgers cornerback, a day two option for the Titans at the cornerback position and a guy that has played man coverage, zone coverage. To me, he has got all of the athleticism that you want in a cornerback prospect. And he is a guy that I am circling on day two for the Titans. I can I can live that life. Here's the other thing too: is Rutgers been known to put out secondary guys for yes they have for a while, man. Uh, I've heard about him a good bit. Max Melton being a potential second day guy as far as his his ability to play. You don't uh, you don't doubt his uh, his playmaking ability. He's shown it, and then his testing backed it backed it up. Also, when you have a dude like him that's coming from Rutgers, I think you have that. That chip on your shoulder factor, too, considering what type of team they were this year. Playing for Greg Schiano, you know this. You know he's going to be a tough-minded guy. Say what you want to about him. We know that to be true. You're going to play hard defense when you're playing at Rutgers under his tenure, man. I like the idea of a second-day guy. We've also said this, too. They got to find some secondary help here. Mm -hmm. And and the other question I will have, as much offensive help that you need, can this be an all- offensive draft for Rand and staff. I don't think it can be a second straight year. So if we're either talking corners, D tackle or linebacker has to be somewhere in the play. Well, it was interesting. Max Melton met with you guys at Titans radio in mobile at the senior bowl. And he told you guys literally said, there is no fear in us on the Rutgers mentality says it all starts from the top down. Greg Schiano He ain't going for none of that soft stuff, Max Milton says. It trickles down. We call ourselves the dark side. If you want to be a part of the dark side, you got to be able to hit. Max Milton tells TennesseeTitans.com and Titans Radio in Mobile at the Senior Bowl. Uh, That sounds a lot like what Denard Wilson wants out of his corners and everything we know about the Titans' new defensive coordinator. Here's what I really like, though, about Max Milton. And he told you guys this in Mobile. He's got four blocked punts in his college career at Rutgers. That doesn't just happen. That guy steps in day one to your roster and is a core special teams player immediately. And I like guys that can cut their teeth as a special teams player, learn how to be a pro and get on the field and learn how to tackle professional football players. And then the way that translates to playing their primary position and their primary trade I think guys can earn meaningful reps and meaningful roles within teams. That's what Amani Hooker did for the Titans at safety and got himself a second contract because he was a fantastic special teamer who showed promise as a secondary player and then became a solid player in this league. And that's where it becomes very, I'm talking about very smart on a guy like him. Like you said, cutting your teeth on special teams, Will, is where a lot of your now starters earn it at also. You got to sell out and show that the team that you're capable of learning, but also committing to the assignment before you start playing at your position. I don't know if he's going to be second round for this team, but I do like him. And of course, a fierce-minded guy. He gets it. That mentality just sounds a lot like what the Titans want. Yep. Two-time All-Big Ten honorable mention playing in 41 career games at Rutgers had eight picks, four blocked kicks, 22 passes defended, 111 tackles at the defensive back position. I've got one more draft crush for you, and it is a player we have spoken a lot about who had a big weekend. Jalen Wright's performance at the NFL Combine turning heads. We'll give you the latest on what analysts say about him coming out of the weekend next. When it comes to large home repairs, a lot of time we homeowners pretend we do not see the warning signs. We are afraid of what we're going to hear. This is especially true with waterproofing and foundation repair. It could be something simple that needs to be fixed right away or maybe a big problem now. I'm telling you this. Either way, you want to get United Structural Systems out to your home. We don't know what it is most timely. Certainly don't want to be sold something we don't need. What we need is a peace of mind. A United, United Structural Systems is the company to give you that. They have over 25,100% satisfied 
residential customers. And here's how they make that happen. When USS comes out to your house, you're going to get a problem solver who provides a peace of mind to the customers. That's you, the homeowner. You're not going to get someone who's worried about meeting a sales quota, upselling the next big thing, but some there to, someone there to educate you and help you understand what is happening with your home. At USS, their only measure of success is how satisfied the homeowner is and not a closing ratio. And that's because homeowners trust USS. They're keeping homes dry and stable for over 25 years. USS, serving Middle Tennessee, Southern Kentucky, Western Kentucky, and Northern Alabama. You can reach them online at USSTN.com or call them. 
RKW is brewed by Ain't the Roast on 104.5 The Zone. Ramon, Kayla, and Will with Ramon Foster. I'm Will Bowling. Kayla Anderson with the morning off. 615-737-1045, our number. We'll take a look at how the top two tackles fared at NFL Combine Drills yesterday. Joe Alt and Olu Fashanu. Yes, it is Fashanu, not Fashanu. Mm-hmm. ESPN.com scouting both of them at the weekend. We'll take a look at that coming up at 8 o'clock. Ramon Foster, Jalen Wright impressed many at the NFL Combine, and those of us that wear orange tinted glasses from time to time knew that he was going to be a pro in a lot of the things that he has been able to do in a Tennessee uniform. 4-3-8 second 40-yard dash after his first one was a bit of an even disappointment, right? It was a 4-4-4, <laughs> and you're thinking like, wow, what's wrong with Jalen Wright? Yeah. Then he runs a 4-3-8. And his athleticism, very impressive. 38-inch vertical, 11-foot-2 broad jump. Uh, one writer said over the weekend that he was likely seen as a day-two pick and could be creeping towards the top 50 after his showing in Indianapolis. I can see that, man. That 4 3 is crazy. Again, uh, I was, went to his page, of course. Uh, well, he was tagged with the Vols uh, football page and the NFL, so they were talking about him just on a uh, broad NFL fan spectrum. And one of the things that people were saying was, imagine running a four three eight at linebacker size. Like, we knew he had breakaway speed, but it's also, and, and this is why it's good to do the uh, combine because you can justify time. You can justify play. You can wonder why he broke away from Kentucky football or Georgia, right, in those moments like that because you see he has the speed. It backs it up, but – uh, downhill type of guy. I did see one of the knocks on him. Got to make sure he secures the ball. That is a fixable, coachable thing right there. But as far as having the ability to play ball, he's got it. Uh, it, it was fun to watch him perform the way he did and and to drop a 4-3-8, knowing that you had it in your back pocket after a 4-4-4. Four, 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 it's not bad. He comes in at five foot ten and a half, two 210 pounds, and runs under 4-4 four, four for the 40. Decent. Junior at that too. Six point seven yards per carry over the last two seasons, splitting carries with Jabari Small at Tennessee, but was still the second fastest back in the combine at four three eight. His seven point four yards per carry, Jalen Wright led all FBS running backs last season. Uh, his explosiveness, his athleticism, has been well documented. What kind of Offense is the best fit for him. Do you think he could walk into a room and earn a number one spot as a lead running back by the halfway point of the 2024 season? I think so. He he has a never die run style. Uh, he's good going side to side. I can see him being a, a counter offense type of team. I can see him being an inside zone type of team, power team, or uh, a toss type of guy. Uh, student body left and right on the basis that he has the speed for it. He does run up high as one of his knocks that he does have for him, but he can be a physical style off, uh, running back that can get to the sideline, bang you, and get out of bounds. Like, that's the type of player that he is. That's what you saw. In between the tackles, he was good. Imagine what he'd do. He had over 1,000 yards with sharing reps with three different dudes. And every time he got in the game, you knew he was going to spring one or break one. That's what you run into. Like, I, I'll, I'll say this in comparison to him and uh, Garendo, Isaac Garendo out of Louisville. For a dude that's slightly faster, Isaac Garendo ran a 4 3 3. Jalen Wright ran a 4 3 8. You never saw Isaac Garendo run the 4 3 3, though. He did have the burst of like, okay, he got a 20, he's got a 10, and he's a big bruising back. I think he's got Jalen by maybe 10 pounds or something like that. But you saw Jalen Wright speed time and time again in those football games. That's where if we're talking about which one I want, obviously, I mean, taking off my orange tinted glasses, I'd pick Jalen Wright just on the basis of he seems to have a, a, a multifaceted game on top of it too. Although Isaac Garendo out of Louisville does catch the ball well out of the backfield too. What is the earliest you would be okay with the Titans selecting a running back in this year's draft? If best available, second. Really? Uh, if if best available. Even behind Tajay Spears? Because you do need a guy. You do? You do need a guy. And that's the biggest issue. You, it's so many positions you need a guy at. I think you could find a great number two in the sixth round. In the sixth? 
I feel that. But if you're looking for a dude like a bang-bang offense style of ball, what did Brian Callahan say? I want guys that can score touchdowns for me, ball in hand. If you feel like you can get a wide receiver who essentially plays running back, then maybe. But then maybe, yeah. I, round two is too early for me, even if Jalen Wright is the best available player sitting there because the Titans need a corner. They need a center. They might need a guard. They might need a right tackle. They need an inside linebacker. They need an edge rusher. Genuinely, they need just about every position. Safety. It's problematic, Will. Center. Did you say center also? Yeah, I did. I did say center. Golly, that's problematic. I think the only way the Titans are taking a day two running back is if they trade out of one of their first two picks mm -hmm. and get themselves another day two pick. Yeah. But I also wouldn't be upset with them adding a legitimate special teamer yeah. at kick returner and or punt returner. And Mike mentions in the F and bag chat on YouTube says, or Tony Pollard is a number two. Tony Pollard. There's enough value on day three of the draft. I'm not spending any of my cap money on a veteran running back. Yeah. Not a single cent. Oh, There's no not. point. Yeah. There's no reason for this team to be in the market for veteran free agent running backs. In my opinion. Unless you're getting one on the cheap. How much is Zach Moss this, this free agency window? Four or five million. Four or five million. I'll pay for a Zach Moss. I would. I'd rather have one for two million in the seventh round who's probably better. That's fair. Isaiah Pacheco is sitting there on day three. Kyron Williams is sitting there. Like, who is that guy in this draft? Yeah. Is Bucky Irving the guy out of Oregon whose stock fell over the weekend because he didn't run in the four threes? It was expected to be one of the fastest running backs. Can you take high value on a guy like that who didn't help himself? Probably. Probably so. There's options for sure. There are a lot of people saying this is probably the most talented draft they've seen in a while. Let's take a look at the top two tackles. 615-737-1045. What did Joe Alts, Olu Fashanu, and let's talk about another prospect we have not spoken about quite as much recently in Tyler Guyton who performed over the weekend as well, the Oklahoma tackle at the NFL Combine. Hour three, second half of the show, next.
What's going on? Happy Monday. Good morning from the 104.5 The Zone Studios. I am Robert Walsh. Record-setting performances at the Combine this weekend. Not only did Texas wide receiver Xavier Worthy break the 40 record with a 4-2-1 in his second run, nine wide receivers ran a sub-440, the most in Combine history. But it wasn't just the wide receivers who were putting on a show. The offensive linemen did the same thing. Joe Alt, Amarius Mims, Olu Fashionu. Uh, Tyler Guyton and Talisi Fuaga all posted top 100 athletic scores out of all the tackles who have worked out of the Combine since 1987. The Bills will release running back Naheem Hines, clearing about $4.6 million in salary cap space. Hines missed all of last season due to a non-football season-ending knee injury. The Bills sent a conditional sixth and Zach Moss for Naheem Hines at the deadline in 2022. For all your foundation repair and waterproofing needs, visit USSTN.com. Breaking news at once on your home for the Titans and the Vols. This is 1045. The Zone. Hour number three starts right now, 8 a.m. on a brand new week in beautiful Music City, USA. Ramon, Kayla, and Will is brewed by 8th and Roast with locations on 8th Avenue, Charlotte, the airport, and the Broadview at Vanderbilt. 8th and Roast Coffee cultivates community by the cup. You can find your favorite retail bag in every local Kroger and Whole Foods as well and every weekday morning you can find 11 year nfl veteran ramon foster right here on these airwaves robert walsh behind the glass making the show happen kayla anderson with the morning off i'm will bowling 615-737-1045 is how you join us in an honor of ramon foster's youngest suffering a bit of an injury over the weekend we ask the question of our question of the day this morning at Ramon Kayla Will on Twitter, what is the worst injury you had as a kid? We have had some great submissions, I will say, this morning. Sloan writes in, when I was seven, I was standing on the recliner pretending to surf. I flipped it over and scratched my chest, and I still have a scar. <laughs> Y'all called in a lot early this morning at about 6.15 this morning. For those of you who are just now waking up and starting your day, and we have heard about some of your trauma. Yeah. There is no doubt. We have. I'm, I'm glad to see one is not just my kids that do this type of stuff. It's yours. And it was also you too in your adult life. I mean, your youth life. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very proud of you guys for surviving your childhood and becoming adults for the most part. 615-737-1045 is our number. ESPN writers analyzed the top two tackles at yesterday's Sunday afternoon workouts. And Joe Alt was quite impressive, wasn't he? Yes, he was. Six foot eight and five eights, 321 pounds. Light feet in the wave drill, according to ESPN's Jordan Reed, a 505 40 yard dash. And ESPN's Jordan Reed says he is likely a top 10 pick, saying the Titans or Jets would be great landing spots. It would be. You get your blanket. Again, I've, I've kind of labeled him as that. Uh, Fashionu, Olu Fashionu out of Penn State is more of a wall. And some are saying he didn't have a great uh, combine. He heard his quad leaving out of that uh, competition or the combine. So that's very fascinating. But when you ask me the question, which one would you choose? Which one are you looking for to, you know, being your guy? If they are picking a left tackle, my thing is just Joe Alt. He lines up. It's just at every single spot as far as what you need. You need a guy to protect the blind side. He does that. You need a guy that's doing well enough in the in the run game. You have that also. You have a guy that has a size. You have that also. You have a guy that doesn't have any bad tape. He checks every single box, and then he backs it up at the combine by being registered as 6'9", 321. He's heavier than I thought he was going to be, which is a good thing. I think he's added probably – they had him listed, I think, during the season about 312, 
315. So anywhere between 5 to 10 pounds of muscle is what I'm guessing a guy like him. Has long arms, have big hands, uh, and he, he did everything else except, and you told me the, the offensive line has the bench press today. Correct. I don't even care what has been. I don't care if he does 20. I don't care if he does 21, 25, okay? He's checked every box that you need him to. A 5 point, I mean a 505 40 with a 173 split at 6 9. That's moving. And if you look at his tape too, he he's he stays low, but he's not a waist bender. He has the ability to get up to the second level. I could go on and on about this guy. You want to talk about a sure fit? He's a sure fit. Olu Fashadu, meanwhile, runs a 5'11 40 yard dash, measuring at six foot six, three hundred and twelve pounds, a nine foot one broad jump, which was strong, and a vertical of thirty-two inches. But again, it's the hand size that's concerning, according to many. Eight and a half inch hands for Olu Fashinu, the tackle out of Penn State. And if you're just now joining us, yes, that is now confirmed how you say his name. You have probably heard us say Olu Fashanu quite a bit. It is Fashanu. Which I, I love, you know, Fashanu. It's okay. good it is. It's, let's reprogram ourselves just in case. Now, if he doesn't come here, Fashanu. <laughs> That's right. If he's a Titan, we get it right. If not, we send it back. We send it back. We we torment him when he comes there. Uh, but two two really solid guys. Um, of course, when it comes down to this this old line class, and it's not just those two; it's others too. I, I'd be remiss, Will, if I don't bring them up because the dude is a specimen. Amarius Mims, you're not supposed to be. What would he weigh in at? Three forty ish. Running the five flat, essentially, 507, two hundredths of a second behind Joe Alt. Like, this dude's measurables, man. When you talk about options, so you spoke about the running backs, right? Well, we've we spoken about the wide receivers, how deep it is at their class, too. And then you look at the offensive line, it's the exact same conversation. The guy that you don't want, the guy that you don't get, there is a guy that you possibly want at a different position. Uh, Amarius Mims, uh, by the way, is one of the main conversations behind Tennessee's first uh, NCAA sanctions, okay, uh, with the brown paper bags and everything. But 6'8", 340 pounds. I told you guys my arm went for 34 and a half. His is 36 and an eighth. Goodness. On top of that, my hands were 10 inches. His is 11 and a, and a quarter inch. This is a big human being, and that ain't even the most impressive part. We're talking about 6'8", 340, running a five flat, essentially. He's closer to a 4-9 than he is a uh, 5-1 almost in a sense. Like, this two is a specimen. And I tell everybody when we're speaking about the Titans now, the silver bullet in all of this as far as getting the potential out of guys, Bill Callahan. Mm-hmm. Bill freaking Callahan. That's fair. And coming up at 920, we are going to talk about what Bill Callahan's perfect offensive lineman looks like. What are the traits you can't coach and can't teach that Bill Callahan is going to say, no, I can work with that? Or what are the things that he's going to see and think, I'm, I can't work with that? We're going to do that with Ramon coming up at 920 this morning. But Ramon, there is a little bit of news out there as the season of lies starts to ramp up post-NFL Combine, especially now that there are rave reviews of J.J. McCarthy's performance, Michigan quarterback, for having a great week in Indianapolis. According to Deshaun Reed and Vic DeFore of The Athletic, the Las Vegas Raiders, Ramon Foster, have been exploring trading up in the first round. Part of that exploration has included general manager Tom Telesco discussing trading to either acquire the fifth, sixth, or seventh, ding, 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 Tennessee mm-hmm. Titans picks in part. Because the Chicago Bears, Washington Commanders, and New England Patriots are, quote, all likely to stay put and draft quarterbacks with the top three picks. Read into four right in the athletic. That type of trade could theoretically be made to put the Raiders in range for a player at another premium position. But it would only make sense if if it were a move up for a QB. Real or fake, Ramon Foster, the Raiders being genuinely interested in trading up for a quarterback? I think it's real. Um, on the basis that their head coach also has to find his guy, too. 
Again, they don't have a quarterback essentially on their roster that they, that they want to believe in. And there's a lot that has to play in the fact of, look, we got time. Like their head coach has time as far as picking the guy and being able to grow and build with them also. Antonio Pierce, right? It's the same conversation we were having about Rand and, and, and Will Levis. Like you're somewhat attached to that quarterback. I know Vrabel was the coach here, and you want to make it work as much as possible if Brian Callahan feels that way. But Antonio Pierce does have to go get his guy it's now his team and here's the best thing about what the vegas uh raiders have going for them too their picks include 13 that's their first round pick so moving up six spots if they have two to seven so when we start talking about what is that worth well the, the second round pick is 44 the third round is 77 if, if you're the titans are you asking for that two and three because we're talking about moving six spots up, right, as far as getting right. that. And you maybe send something back to them as far as uh, negotiating those picks to say, hey, we can't be without our second and third round pick. Do we trade spots? Because the Titans will be picking seven in each round, if I'm not mistaken, as far as the picks go. So if we're talking about you getting the fourth, swapping the second or and getting their third, that's a conversation I live with right there. Well, they have enough, and they got three sevens to give you, and they got – how many picks is that? They got a uh, nine picks. The Raiders, yeah, nine yeah, picks this year. Right, yeah, they've got one, two, a three, a four, a five, a six, and three sevens. And three sevens. Uh, one of those sevens is actually from the Titans uh, at two twenty-five. So again, for precedent, this would be the Raiders moving up from thirteen to seven. Last season, the Detroit Lions traded with the Arizona Cardinals and went from twelve to six. They did that to take Paris Johnson, the tackle out of Ohio State, who played right tackle for them this past year. But if I'm Rand Carthon and I know you want a quarterback, price is higher. Yeah, just a little bit. If you're training up knowing that you're taking a quarterback, you are more willing to give up more draft capital than you are to move up and take the number six overall pick and take a tackle. So just the fact that J.J. McCarthy could be a guy in play at six makes the number seven overall pick more valuable than it was last year when there was no clear quarterback option that the Lions were trading up for at that point. The Cardinals were trading up for at that point at number six. So last season, in return for the number six pick, the Lions received 12, 34, and 168. The Cardinals got six and 81. So again, in this scenario, let's just replace the teams. Instead of Lions and Cardinals, it's Titans and Raiders. Would you take... Picks 12, 34, and 168 to give up your pick in the 80s, which the Titans don't have one because they don't have a third-round pick. So that's where this would get a little more interesting. And you give up your first-round pick to move back six spots. I think for a quarterback, if I'm Rand Carthon, I say give me picks 13, 44, and 77. You're giving me your first three picks if you want to move up and get a quarterback at number seven, or you're giving me a second next year. You're either giving me 1344 and a second next year, or you're giving me 1344 and a third this year. Coldest thing is, if we're moving from seven to 13, you still got plenty of high quality options too. Yes, you do. That's the other side. You still get a premier playmaker because JJ McCarthy is not one of the top 10 players in this draft. And that means that there is one extra top 15 player available to you then at 13. And the options, real quick, of uh, tackles. You'll still have J.C. Uh, Latham, Talise Fuanga, Amarius Mims, Troy Fatanau. Oh, how do you say it? Fatanu? Fatanu. Fatanu. I believe. Fatanu. Yeah, but again, Fatanu. we thought I'm it was Fashanu, and we were wrong on that. Uh, <laughs> uh, and Tyler Guyton, still. 615-737-1045. We'll get back to your phone calls coming up at a half hour at 845. But coming up next... A huge win for Tennessee and Tuscaloosa over the weekend. Mike Wilson of the Knoxville News Sentinel joins us to tell us just how close Tennessee is to that number one seed. Next, on Ramon, Kayla, and Will.
Our KW, Ramon, Kayla, and Will is brewed by 8th and Rose on 104.5 The Zone. Ramon Foster, Will Bowling with you. Kayla Anderson with the morning off. As we're joined right now by one of our very good friends, by Mike Wilson on Twitter. He is the, the Knoxville News Sentinels, Mike Wilson. What's up, Mike? How are you? Good. You know, I did wake up, though, with a hankering for, for a bagel, but... Ah. I didn't. I didn't have anyone ship me bagels lately, so I'm a little bit, a little bit devastated. Oh, it's Ooh. tough. Did, did you see something on social media where <laughs> people are like shipping off bagels, Mike? Is that what? <laughs> yeah, the- <laughs> yeah, I did. Um, a pretty good guy named um, Bill Wolling, <laughs> just a guy I know, may or may not have shipped bagels to to someone, and it wasn't me. May or may not have done that. That's possible. I, you, you, I know you have a friend by the name of Will that you call a friend that would have definitely sent mm. you a, like a, a, a dozen bagels, right? You'd think, but I think the hierarchy has shifted in the last <laughs> <laughs> Straight from Jersey. They are good, Mike. We'll have to, we, we might have to arrange that when you're here next weekend for the SEC tournament. I like it. I like what we're talking about now. Now I feel better. That's good. But, no, he's bragging on them, though, like explaining how good they are, and you don't have one in hand, Mike. I, I, you you let them off the hook way too easy. You know, now I'm angry again. You're right. <laughs> uh, it, it is interesting. Next weekend, we've got a lot of mics in the studio. I'm looking around. Uh, we've got four extra microphones in addition to our three. Uh, how many Tennessee basketball reporters can we get in the studio next week to have, like, a round table? Tennessee hoops discussion between you, Ben McKee, Grant, Ryan Shumpert. I mean, we, we've got to get as many experts in this room as possible next weekend. You don't want that. <laughs> <laughs> that, that would go off the rails very quickly, and that's you great. don't want that. No, that's what we want. That's exactly I just want to sit here and sip coffee and just let y'all talk. Exactly. Right. Mm. That'd be great. <laughs> Don't ask for things you don't want. Uh, well, fair enough. Um, Mike, uh, Josiah Jordan-James had uh, three words to sum up Tennessee's win over Alabama. The perfect three words. Rick Barnes masterclass. That final 14 minutes where Alabama goes three for 21 from the floor in their own building. How in the world did Tennessee pull that off? Uh, Rick Barnes masterclass. Perfect. No, um, man, it, it, Tennessee, what, what I took from that game was, Tennessee went back to its bread and butter, right? That That's how they've sustained. That's how they've won games in recent years when they didn't have an offense the caliber that it has now. And that offense was in a bit of a, a drought. I mean, they were in a three for 23 spell at a point there. It was 10 misses, three makes, 10 misses. So they had to lean back on the thing that defined them and carried them through past seasons, and they were able to do so. Mike, this win to me, it feels like – showed us Tennessee can overcome its worst-case scenarios. And there were a couple of them, right? Jonas Adu and Tobey Awaka getting in foul trouble, the long shooting droughts that we've seen doom Tennessee in March when they just can't have a 10-minute drought, and they do. And Dalton Cadet getting in foul trouble. How many of those concerns and biggest worries about this team did this win maybe dispel for you over the weekend? Yeah, I mean, my biggest concern with this team all year has been the lack of post depth, um, being that Jonas uh, Adu and Tobey Walker are pretty much the two. I mean, J.P. Estrella went in for a few minutes and, and didn't hurt Tennessee, which is what you want in that moment. I mean, that's a freshman who plays sparingly going into a big-time road game and holding his own at least. So that was good. But the fact that Tennessee could go small ball, put Josiah at the five for basically eight minutes of the first half was significant. Now, it helped them that Grant Nelson was in foul trouble for Alabama, and that's easily their most competent big man as well. Uh, But that was huge. And I think what Tennessee really showed, which should be a comfort to Tennessee fans, is this team has the pieces and roster to play any style of game. They played a two-big lineup and a five-guard lineup in the same game the other day. Um, One was more effective than the other, but they've won games recently with the two-big lineup more than the five-guard lineup. So this is a roster that can match up with about anyone and has the pieces to put in there and say, all right, this is going to work in this particular game. Mike, looking at this game, man, it was it was fascinating, of course. College game day, 
um, night game on the road at Alabama. And before that game, you had a bunch of their fans screaming overrated. They had the the, the post-game uh, storm of the court crew ready. There was a lot of expectations as far as what was going to happen at Alabama for SEC game, right? But I have to ask you this. What growth have you seen out of Dalton Connect with all of that? Mm-hmm. But I felt like earlier in the season, you saw him pressing more trying to split double teams, and it seems to me his understanding, whether it be through him or Coach Barnes, has told him, you do have teammates that can help you out also. Is that something that you've seen over the course of this year for him? Yeah, I mean, obviously we've witnessed Dalton Connect go supernova mode quite a few times, including on t- or Wednesday against Auburn with the 27 second half points, 25 and 12 minutes. But within that, Alabama threw a double team at Dalton Connect the first time he touched the ball the other day. He passed out, and I believe it led to a Tennessee three. Um, I think there was a couple more passes after he passed out of it, but I believe it led to a three. That has been a point, I believe, is you don't have to do it all yourself. Like, you've got a lot of good players around you, and Tennessee proved that to other people, and maybe to Dalton. I mean, I think he already knows that. He's practiced and played with these guys for so long. Um, But they have a lot of guys who can get this done. What was it, seven guys with with eight points in that game, at least eight points in that game. So there's a lot of capable players on this Tennessee team. And this was the second time this year Tennessee's gone on the road, not gotten more than 15 from Dalton Connect or 15 or so, and won the game because of what everyone else did as well. And Kentucky was the other one. So that's a hugely encouraging sign as well, that Tennessee's capable of not getting Dalton Connect's best and still winning games because it has so many other pieces that can do things for you. If you listen to his teammates, Mike, then you hear it resonates through their words. But J- Jemai Meshack may have had the mm-hmm. most efficient eight points that we've ever seen in, in a basketball game as of late because of everything else he does on the court. What has been his role, and how has that been a crucial part for this team in winning the way they did like this past weekend? Yeah, I mean, Jemai Meshack's must-watch TV when it comes to defense, and I certainly hope no one fell asleep at halftime of the game the other day because what he <laughs> did in the second half was absolutely phenomenal. Um, Jemai Meshack is an ace defender for Tennessee. He's a guy that Rick Barnes can turn to off the bench. And, you know, coaches talk about the instant offense guy. Jemai Meshack's instant defense. You throw him in there, he's going to shut somebody down, and he's going to control the game on that end of the court. He's been doing that all season. Now, what he gave the other day was three-point shooting, and that's not, that's not so much his staple. He's shooting them pretty efficiently this year, especially compared to in past seasons. But Jemai's always been more of a grab the offensive rebound in a crowd, put back, um, drive, get fouled, make free throws. Hitting a corner three to take a lead at Alabama is not necessarily who he's been um, throughout his career, but he's capable. And I think that really summarizes the roster in a lot of ways. Is they've got so many guys that are capable – that when things need to happen, there are guys ready to do it. Knoxville News Sentinel's Mike Wilson, our guest this morning on Ramon, Kayla, and Will, and the person who may or may not have received bagels from me last week <laughs> may or may not have also fell asleep early before uh, the game ended. It's what I'm told since I was uh, calling Nashville SC the other night and my Go Vols texts were not answered at that point. But anyway, I digress. <laughs> Mike, when you take a look at Tennessee, South Carolina later this week, Vols can clinch a share of the SEC championship with a win is South Carolina, the kind of team that you think could give Tennessee the most trouble, just the way that they can match the balls in terms of defensive intensity. Yeah. So there are two confusing results for me this year for Tennessee basketball. Uh, One is losing at home to South Carolina and the other is beating Florida by like 20 (laughs) because Florida is really good. It turns out. Um, And I I was surprised by that one at the time. And I'm more so surprised by that one now because of how well Florida's played. Um, the South Carolina loss, I think Tennessee was like 13-point favorites and didn't make a lot of sense at the time, still kind of a head-scratcher. Stylistically, I think is where South Carolina does give teams some problems. I mean, they muck it up. Lamont Paris is the old Wisconsin assistant that's been talked about. They play a style that, you know, it, it's more what Tennessee did last year. Um, Tennessee, to me, thrives at this point in, in run-and-gun, shoot em out kind of games. Um, You've seen that Arkansas, those sort of things, and you'll see them struggle with Missouri because Missouri mucks it up as well. There is a style element that's hard with with South Carolina, with the way they want to slow the game down, change the tempo, and dictate things. What Tennessee has to do is not get dragged into that tempo like they have at other points this year because when Tennessee dictates the tempo, 
they win games um, and pretty much all the time because they can play however they want when they're dictating it. And Tennessee's good in, in most ways. So I think there is some challenge. There are some challenges there. I still think Tennessee's probably going to win this one. I thought they should have beat South Carolina last time as well. Mike, is Tennessee a one seed in your opinion? And which is the better route being a two seed Ooh. in the South or a one seed in the West where you could play a two seeded Arizona, but there's a chance they could have home court advantage if you saw them in the elite eight. Yeah, so it's a hard one. And the selfish journalist in me says, give me the two seed in the Midwest because the travel is the easiest. Um, the, the numbers say you want to be a one seed. Your, your odds are better of going to the final four as a one seed than they are any other seed. Um, it's advantageous to have a four or a five in the, sec, the, the second weekend than a three. Um, it's to your advantage to be a one seed. So Tennessee should want the one seed, even if it means going out west. Now, if you fall to a two seed or, or remain a two seed, however you want to see that, to me, you want to be in the Midwest. Um, my, my reasoning on that is, yeah, you're probably going to have to see Zach Eady at, at some point in that because Purdue's going to be the one in the Midwest. But you've already seen Zach Eady. It's not, it's not an unfamiliar seven foot four, 300 pounder. It's still a seven foot four, 300 pounder. It's a guy you've seen. And I do think there's an edge to that. I think Houston stylistically presents challenges. I think that, to me, after UConn, Houston's the next team that I wouldn't want to face if I was Tennessee, um, at least not until the, the final weekend, ideally, which is, again, what the one seed does for you is avoids all of that until the end. So you want to be a one seed is what I'm trying to say. Mike Wilson of the Knoxville Center Wood this morning. Mike, I have to ask you this as the SEC uh, regular season is coming to a close. How, how do you determine SEC player of the year as far as Mark Sears goes <laughs> And Dalton Connect. Eh, take off the orange tinted glasses, okay? <laughs> I, I know where you land, but what's the big conversation in a room full of coaches and voters? Uh, I don't know what the conversation is anymore. Um, Dalton Connect averages three or four more points per game than Mark Sears in SEC play, shooting better from the field, shooting better from three, better assist to turnover ratio. And, you know, Bruce Pearl bought, brought this idea of he votes for the best player in the best team. Well, as it stands, that's Tennessee. Um, so it should be Dalton Connect. I tweeted during the Auburn game, it should be unanimous. I'm willing to bet it won't be. But I think it is Dalton Connect. And you can't look at what he's done this year and not say he's been the most effective team-changing player in the SEC. And he's also clearly been the best player um, pretty much since the second game at Mississippi State. So... Uh, Mark Sears has had an absolutely tremendous year, and it's kind of brutal to not win SEC Player of the Year when you average like 21 and a half per game in the conference. But it's a really interesting year when you get a guy like Dalton Connect that comes through things. He's entitled to his own opinion as far as Bruce Pearl is concerned, but is that like a, a lazy take us into going to the uh, SEC Player of the Year conversation by sending him a vote for the best player on the best team? I don't think it's a lazy take. I think people do think that way sometimes. I mean, it's probably parallel to the coach of the year thinking in that, well, it's not the, the team that wins it. It's the, the coach that shows the most improvement from last year to this year or, and so on. Um, to me, there's validity in that thought process that Bruce Pearl has, but I would apply it personally as a tiebreaker of a, these two are equal on paper. Mm -hmm. I need to separate them somehow. So what am I going to separate them with? Oh, their team won the title. Um, I don't think it should be a determining factor. Um, I look back to 2017. Sandarius Thornwell was undoubtedly the SEC player of the year that year. South Carolina finished fourth in the league. Um, guy averaged 19, carried a pretty okay team to end up going to the Final Four um, throughout SEC play. So I, I think it's more of a tiebreaker in my mind, is how I would apply it, than a dictating decision maker. Gotcha. He is Mike Wilson of the Knoxville News Sentinel at by Mike Wilson, where you find him on Twitter. Mike, I am told by a certain Peyton K who is on television in Nashville. <laughs> she is willing to share one of her prized bagels <laughs> with you next weekend when you're in town for the SEC tournament. I mean, I'm going to use these radio waves to manipulate my food intake all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mike. <laughs> all right. There's Mike Wilson with uh, us here this morning talking uh, hoops and bagels. Uh, if you are unfamiliar, I sent my girlfriend a shipment for her birthday of her favorite bagels from her favorite New Jersey bagel place called O Bagel. I will give them a free shout out because they are delicious. They are so good. 
delicioso. I may have stolen one when we had our weekly bachelor viewing You're last entitled week. to that. It was really good. You're entitled to that. I also learned that I put significantly less cream cheese on a bagel than her and most humans. <laughs> if there's cream cheese sticking out of the middle part of the bagel, I send it back. Really? I want just like a little covering. Just a sliver for a taste. Uh-huh. Okay. But I know I'm weird. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Coming up, more headlines, 615-737-1045. Mike Evans has a new deal. We'll tell you details next. Fellas, if you're feeling tired and grumpy, man, have noticed a lack of motivation and drive, y'all might have low T. It's just that simple, okay? Low testosterone levels can cause weight gain, loss of muscle mass, and so much more. I recommend to you Low T Center. That's why I get my levels tested. They make it quick and easy to get your levels checked also. And it's only $25. And with their on-site lab, you'll get results back in about 25 minutes. Most insurance is accepted for the treatment, too. You can go to LowTCenter.com now to book your appointment online. Low T Center, reinventing men's health care.
Coming up on the final hour of the show in a matter of minutes, Ramon, Kayla, and Will, RKW is brewed by 8th and Roast. We'll get to everything you missed in the first three hours this morning. Recap the show for you coming up at 9 o'clock. 615-737-1045 is our number. Some news out of Tampa Bay this morning. Mike Evans and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers have a deal. Two-year contracts, avoiding free agency, keeping the former number seven overall pick for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in the Sunshine State. And another wide receiver in the free agent market goes off the border, Bone Foster. Yes, sir. Yesterday's price is not today's price, not even for 30-year-olds. How old is uh, Mike Evans right That's now? That's a good question. 30. Uh, I thought he was 31. He was drafted in 2014. No, I don't look he it up. Is, guess, 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 guess. I'm going to go 30 in some it. days. Yep, 30 in 203 days. So, so he'll 31. be 31 this upcoming season. So, again, we, we will start to uh, – we'll have to start reevaluating what we think of age. Uh, that was a, one thing, so we'll have Charles Davis on tomorrow. By the way, go ahead and give that away. Love that. 8 At, o'clock tomorrow morning, Charles Davis of NFL Network. And one thing I heard him talk about this week was how coaches are changing their mindsets on players' age at the combine. It's not the same athlete. It's not the same conversation. You get guys a little bit more polished, too. And, of course, the NFL is about staying cheap and young, too. So if you get them old, you get them out quick. Uh, But he's saying that that narrative has somewhat changed as far as how you view these guys. And I think the same thing has to happen on the NFL level. I think most Titans fans this year are asking for DeAndre Hopkins back. D Hop is 31, 32. He is back. Yeah. And and had I well, yeah, technically is probably get a little bit of an increase in pay because of what he did last year. And the fact that you don't have a prominent another number one other than himself. Um, but watching a guy like Mike Evans get this one, he's earned it. He's that good, had another monster year. And you throw in the fact that he's one of the best doing it. So he got paid and compensated as such. What's the deal numbers again, Will? Two years, fifty two million with thirty five million dollars guaranteed. They got enough to pay him one for 30 plus million, essentially, and just uh, whatever the cap is after mm-hmm. that. Multi touchdown performances for Mike Evans last season in week 12 and week 16. 100 plus yard games against the Bears, Titans, and Panthers. Mike Evans, who has five Pro Bowl selections, including this past season in 2023, also a three time Walter Payton Man of the Year nominee with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Was he your number one receiver in this free agent class? No, I didn't think he was, really? would be that high up. I, I just didn't think he would be that high up as far as um, the need for a guy like him. Um, who, who do we have out there? Um, T. Higgins, Calvin T. Higgins. Ridley, Hollywood Brown, uh, Michael Pittman. Calvin Ridley I thought would have been one of the highest just because of really? what he did in the short sample size for them. A year being removed from being suspended, too. Um, he was a guy I thought that was going to command a lot, and he still may command a good bit. Um, Hollywood Brown is another guy I think would be middle of the road, but he's a guy you want on your squad. I don't know, man. Mike Evans reached 1,000 yards for the 10th straight season this past fall. That is an NFL record for the start of a career and only one season shy of tying Hall of Famer Jerry Rice who has the overall record of 11 straight seasons of 1,000-plus yards. I thought the age is why. I was wrong. I was wrong. You know, and it's the same way I feel about Odell. Odell's up right now. Do you sign a guy like him? Uh, Robert, how how did you feel the production of Odell Beckham was for the Ravens last year? I ain't going to lie. You scared the hell out of me calling me Robert. I thought I messed (laughs) up, man. (laughs) Robert? Pay attention up here. Imagine how Miles felt. That's, your given, on Friday that's night. like it's like calling Chuck E. Cheese Charles Edward Cheese, Charles Entertainment Cheese. The his uh, government name. The expectation for Odell Beckham, I think, was a little higher than what the actual uh, the actual production you got out of okay. him was. Despite being an older guy, he had the injury concerns. Right, he had the injury in the Super Bowl that kept him out of yeah from playing for a whole year. Mike Evans, despite being that old, has been super consistent, right? T- like Will said, Very. 10 years of 1,000 a th- a yards minimum. And there were a couple years in there, I think he had like 1,006, 1,011. Right. Imagine one catch. He just gets minus seven yards and this whole status thrown out the window. But I- I'll regress, as Kayla says. Let me regress <laughs> back a little bit. 
Uh, Mike Evans is the guy, is the picture perfect uh, picture of consistency. So when you're going and you're going to pay a guy like that, you kind of know what you're going to get. There is a certain level of expectation that comes with him. So it's different than paying another 31 year old or 30 year old receiver, uh, which is why I think he got this boatload of cash to come back to Tampa. Now they kind of have to look towards Baker Mayfield if they're going to spend some more cash in the offseason. I, I will say, watching him in Tampa this year, he put on the clinic. Even with the drops he had, he could have had way more yards. He had like two, three sure catches that he just dropped, and he made it up, though. The difference between Mike Evans and Odell Beckham is Odell Beckham's last 1,000-yard season was in 2019 with the Cleveland Browns. Since then, Mike Evans has had 3,000-yard seasons in 2021, 20, 22, and 23, so four, actually, since 2019 because Odell Beckham missed 2022. Mm, mm, mm. He's good. He earned it. Give it to him. Give him all of it, okay? Yeah. <laughs> Give him all of it. I would agree. But, again, Mike Evans at the wide receiver position I don't think is the kind of guy who is coming here anyway. No. Nah. He was never an option for the Titans, in my opinion. He just set the market, though. He did. He certainly did. 26 a year. So how does this affect Baker Mayfield, or does it? Me personally? Because of what he did with Mike Evans, I think Baker comes back. I agree. I think this helps them keep Baker Mayfield. It might make other defensive players available. It, like, uh, like Devin White. Devin White. Former LSU inside linebacker. I, I think this helps keep Baker's number low. You know a team that could use an inside linebacker? Uh, who will? One down the road that's building a stadium. Yeah. They could. Titans, for sure. Is that one you address in free agency and draft? Inside linebacker? Do you sign one and draft one? Oh, depending on if they move back. <laughs> yeah. If you move back, you definitely draft one also to learn of, under a guy like um, Devin White if they pursue him in free agency. I don't know what his number is going to be, but you need one. Aziz, I like Aziz. I do. We'll recap everything we've discussed on the show this morning. Coming up next for you, 615-737-1045, including a lively question of the day topic as well as a Tennessee win in Tuscaloosa. Tackles performing yesterday at the NFL Combine and a record going down in NCAA hoops yesterday as Ponytail Pete, as she's being called, resets the record books. We'll talk about it next.
What's going on? Nine o'clock. Good morning from the 104.5 The Zone studios. I am Robert Walsh. Record-setting performances all weekend at the Combine. Not only did Texas wide receiver Xavier Worthy break the 40 record, but he also, or the wide receivers in general, ran a sub-449 of them. That is the most in Combine history. But it wasn't just the wide receivers who were putting on a show. The offensive linemen did as well. Joe Alt, Amarius Mims, Tyler Guyton, Talisi Fuaga all posted top 100 athletic scores out of tackles who have worked out of the Combine since 1987. And the news today, free agency will not happen for Mike Evans because he is staying in Tampa Bay, signing a two-year, $52 million contract that includes $35 million guaranteed, 10 seasons in a row of at least 1,000 yards For Mike Evans, who's staying in Tampa Bay, now their attention turns to Baker Mayfield, keeping him in Tampa for the coming years. For all your foundation repair and waterproofing needs, visit USSTN.com. Breaking news at once on your home for the Titans and the Vols. This is 104.5 The Zone. Nine a.m. in Nashville, and the fourth and final hour is here. Ramon, Kayla, and Will RKW. We're brewed up by Eighth and Rose. Six one five seven three seven one zero four five is how you join us. Streaming live on one zero four five The Zone TV, Facebook Live, YouTube, Twitter, or Twitch. Twitch, Twitch, Twitch. <laughs> That's Robert Walsh making the show happen. Ramon Foster is here and present. Kayla Anderson with the morning off. I'm Will Bowling. Six one five. Seven three seven one zero four five. A fast three hours to begin the week so far. Has been, man. Hey, shout out to y'all, man. Way to go, Bert. Beat me on the Twitch, please. Uh, sure, did. give it to you. That was a good one. You got to be quicker than that, man. Ooh, good dude, got to be quicker than that. That's what they told him at the combine. <laughs> <laughs> ah, you dog. Far too slow. <laughs> Tough. That sounds like Buck. That's what's so crazy about the John Robinson drop right there. It actually sounds like Buck Rising's voice. Far too slow. It does a little bit. It does, not it? All right, I know I wasn't tripping. Your mom. It sounds just like them. Who knew they were buddies? Our question of the morning on Twitter, at Ramon Kayla Will, what is the dumbest injury you got as a kid? David writes in, Madison Little League in the early 90s. Ball goes over the fence. Instead of doing the common sense thing and walking around, my best friend Justin decided to climb the 10-foot fence. A few minutes and a very unfortunate 90s outfit later, Justin gets his pants hung on the fence, flips him over, and breaks his arm on the landing. Whoa. Lost your trousers and your arm in one piece. Oh, my. Come on, man. <laughs> wait, wait. See, this is what parents like me when they tell you, you think you're smarter than me, huh? Chris in Nashville has an injury for us. 615-737-1045. What's up, Chris? Hey, guys. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. morning. Hey, so uh, real quick, uh, this was at a, a high school track meet. This is during the era of the flip phone. So nice. this was social media. This was, uh, we had eight to ten schools at the conference track meet. My, we was all at the top of the bleachers. Uh, my best friend was trying to hide from the hurdles. He gets called out. He looks at us. He says, man, I don't want to run these hurdles. If I start to get beat, I'm faking the cramp. <laughs> Me and my other best friend, we're rolling. We're laughing. We're like, no, you won't. He said, yes, I will. So the gun goes off. First hurdle is completed. He's actually top two. So we're thinking he's actually going to win this. Come to the second hurdle. He starts to phase out. Then he grabs the back of his leg, and he army crawls on the conference championship meet. He's army crawling on the track. Me and my best friend at the top of the bleachers, we are horse laughing. Tears run out of our eyes because we're thinking, this guy really pulled off an Academy Award winning performance. He is army crawling on the track. He faked a crown. He gets on the bleachers. They put uh, crutches underneath him. Uh, one of the assistant coaches comes up to us and says, hey, he uh, ruptured his, his Achilles. Oh. We, were like, hey. we were like, dang. You know, and my best friend at the time that, was, that ruptured his Achilles, he said, dude, 
he said, it sounded like a gunshot went off in the back of my leg, and the next thing I know, I hear you two jokers laughing at the top of the bleachers. <laughs> and I'm like, hey, you know, you can't blame us for that, because at the time, we thought you were faking a clown. So that, that story, I was like, that, I always stuck with this still to this day. Yeah. Man, that's awesome. <laughs> Thank good. you for the call, Chris. We appreciate it. Be careful what you ask that for. That's tough. <laughs> He planned oh. on faking it and got the real thing. No, that's for real, though. Have y'all ever been in the environment or around somebody when Achilles ruptures uh -uh. like that? Yeah. My buddy was wrestling in the, the finals of a tournament. So it's quiet. Everybody's just watching the match, and you just hear that. And it sounds like a gun going off. It's, oh. It is a loud, audible pop, and it is very scary. Yeah, no, it it, it is, man. Uh, I've heard people tell me that. Like, I've been around people that had it happen like twice, and it's the exact same conversation. Sound like somebody shot. That's what it says. <laughs> Goodness sakes. Can you imagine? Oh, my gosh. That's that's Words are important, man. You got to stop saying stuff like that. <laughs> I bet your buddy won't, bet he won't say anything else crazy. It's funny that type of stuff happens, but when you ask to hit the lottery, that doesn't happen. Right. I'm sit loud on there. I'm hitting the lottery this week. I want to hit the lottery. Okay. All right. It's like a half a billion. You get to work with us. You already hit the lottery. Mm, yeah. That way we can just buy this place. What you think? Oh, I like that what idea. You think about that? You like that? <laughs> First order of business, let's get Bird Ray. <laughs> <laughs> let's get Bird Ray. <laughs> Y'all can have one too, I guess. But <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the First order, Bert, you and me, Will, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Todd on Twitter, at Rabone Kayla Will on Worst Childhood Injuries says, Scratched cornea from trying to race a kid to the slide. Had to wear an eye patch for <laughs> kindergarten graduation. Thanks a lot, Kate. <laughs> Why are you blaming Kate? <laughs> well, well, Kate was just minding her own business this morning, Todd. Dang. I bet, I bet Kate's listening right now. It's like, I can't believe, Todd. You shouldn't have been slow. <sighs> Probably what she said. So. Yeah, that's right. If you weren't five too slow, you would have exactly Kate to the slide, and she'd have the scratch. Now, I'm not yet. the only one. By the way, the merry-go-round they don't even have those no more. Do they not? I was the kid, man. They used to just spin the entire class and just <laughs> shoosh, <laughs> shoosh. <laughs> make that noise too when you did that. One hundred percent, man. Mm -hmm. I was trying to prove my strength as a young first and second grader. So over the weekend, ponytail Pete. Is the new leading scorer in Division I basketball history. That, of course, is Caitlin Clark, who yesterday needed 18 points to pass Pistol Pete Maravich, who scored 3,667 points in three seasons at LSU from 1967 to 1970. Women's College Game Day in the house for number six Iowa, number two Ohio State. I was tuned into this. It was interesting. They had yeah. Gus Johnson on the call. Oh, straight up. For Iowa, Ohio State women's basketball, a 93-83 win as the female Dalton Connect sets the new record for scoring in Division I college basketball. Right, congratulations to her. She's ice cold. You got to give it to her. Her skill set is through the roof, man, with what she's capable of. She's, she's I ain't going to say she's changing the women's game. She's just adding to a rich history of a female athletes being able to just take over a game like that. It is fascinating watching her and her shot selection crazy her ability to get open is crazy and she has that Steph Curry effect of never stop moving you know what I'm saying that you got to appreciate with how she's playing the game bar's been raised for sure absolutely other headlines this morning Mike Evans gets a two-year 52 million dollar deal with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in terms of the Titans interesting stuff from Di Diana Rossini of the Athletic this morning who says multiple teams had Mike Evans on their free agent wide receiver board and were hoping to land him in free agency. Based on several team sources, those teams included Rams, Chiefs, Patriots, Giants, Panthers, Falcons, Jaguars, and Titans. Titans. Diana Rossini saying this morning, the Titans were interested in wooing Mike Evans in free agency. What does that tell us about the Titans? Free agency priorities. Wide receivers in that. Wide receiver one. Yeah. It sounds like is an option for the Titans in free agency. Yeah. I uh I appreciate the aggressiveness. Um and of course understanding what Mike uh Mike Evans got, they understand what type of bag that they have to. Would you been okay with paying a guy 
like Mike Evans, $25 plus million dollars essentially. And I know the old conversation, well, they didn't pay AJ that. You know what I'm saying? Well, come up. What, how you feel about a Mike Evans conversation? Yeah, that's why that GM isn't here anymore and we've got a new one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know why I forgot that. I forgot that. <laughs> You're 100% correct. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think the thing about Mike Evans that would have been interesting here is what Rand Carthon said to you guys at the OTP. Staying out of the business of day one of free agency. Would they have been interested in Mike Evans on a one-year prove-it veteran deal? That, to me, makes more sense than the Titans being in on Mike Evans on a two- or three-year contract offer. Because that would be day one of free agency kind of offer. I think we get another answer out of this too, Will. I asked you that question to follow up also for myself is... It also show you the aggressiveness to surround Will Levis with weapons. The fact that you have D Hop, Traylon still in the building also, but you also thinking of pursuing a guy like Mike Evans. If Rossini's report is one hundred percent true, and I think it has to have some leverage there. I mean, some truth to it, right? It tells you what they feel about Will Levis and surrounding him. I told you if you're going to do one thing is to see what you have in that quarterback, and that's Brian Callahan's first task, I think. Is do we overcommit to a guy down the line? Mm-hmm. And you got the grace of him only being in year two with no fifth year option and right. a second round pick. He's easily to let go if he doesn't work. There's also new reporting this morning, also in the athletic, from Vic DeFore and Tashawn Reed that the Las Vegas Raiders want to trade up. In the athletic this morning, the word for word report the Raiders have been exploring trading up and maybe not as high as you think, according to league and team sources. It may be unrealistic to swing a trade to move into the top three picks, considering the Bears, Commanders, and Patriots all need quarterbacks. Caleb Williams, Jaden Daniels, and Drake May are widely considered to be the top three quarterbacks available. New general manager Tom Telesco has also had conversations centered on potentially trading for picks in the five to seven range which are owned by the Los Angeles Chargers, New York Giants, and Tennessee Titans. That type of trade could be made to put the Raiders in range for another trade up later or a player at another premium position, but it mostly makes sense if it's a move up for a quarterback like Michigan's J.J. McCarthy. Tom Telesco, when asked about trading for a quarterback in Indy, said, You have to weigh how bad you want the player and how much you're giving up. It's just a judgment decision. Part of that is we may think we know the player is going to hit, but we really don't. You never 100% know. In this scenario, the Titans will be moving from 7 to 13 should they be seen as a trade partner for the Las Vegas Raiders. Let's react to that coming up next and take more phone calls at 615 737 104.5. Are you okay with a move back to 13? How legitimate is this report? Plus the topic we've been wanting to have with Ramon. What will Bill Callahan want out of an offensive lineman if that is the pick in the first round? We'll dive into that next.
Monday morning rolls on at hour number four on Ramon, Kayla, and Will. RKW is brewed up by Eighth and Roast. Athletic writers say that the Las Vegas Raiders are interested in moving up and that they are eyeing five, six, or seven in the draft with the Chargers, with the Giants, or with the Titans to go get a quarterback. Ramon Foster, Will Bowling with you. Kayla Anderson with the morning off back on the show tomorrow. What would it take for you to be willing to move back to number 13? And Ramon, as the Titans have a need for a premier playmaker in the first round of the 2024 draft, is 13 too far back? Or is that within the realm of where you are willing to move if you're Rand Carthon? I'm, I'm okay with moving into that world right there. Just simply because if you need a tackle, there's still some good ones right there. If you need a wide receiver, there's still some good ones right there, too. And the fact that the Raiders are going to move up for their quarterback means that another skill position is still left available for you or one of those tackles that we've talked about. Now, you have uh, the hard decision to make as a GM, as a front office, as a new head coach. Did we miss out on our sure guy at left tackle? Now, I've told you before, the silver bullet in all of this comes down to Bill Callahan being in that building now. What what everybody I've talked to thinks about him and just what his track record has shown, that if you give me a talented guy, I can work with him. Now, the guy that you know I've been high on as far as if you don't get Olu uh, Fashino or Joe Alt, um, Amarius Mims. He's a guy that I think is more capable of playing left tackle. I know J.C. Latham is still there, but it's not just him. It's other positions that are that that have a lot of um, high value there when it boils down to overall prospects. And especially at that point, Will, if we're talking about there's been four. There's been four quarterbacks taken by that point. You're left with, of course, Marvin Harrison Jr. is probably gone at that time. Um, Malik Neighbors maybe. Brock Bowers. It, that's where. We we'll start having a conversation. Best available threat left, Brock Bowers, as opposed to a top seven, top ten pick. Mm -hmm. Do you feel more comfortable about Brock Bowers at 13 than you do with him at seven? At 13, I'm way comfortable Absolutely. with him at that point. You know what I'm saying? And, of course, you can always go DN, D-tackle. Well, not really D-tackle at that spot, but there's an outside edge rusher. Can never have plenty of those. Best way to beat this, this new AFC South? Get after the quarterback. We see Andy do it. We see Jacksonville got it. And we also see Houston being a team like that. D good in the F and Bank chat, uh, or Jeremy, excuse me, the F and Bank chat says a future first would have to be part of the package. I don't think that's realistic. I just don't. I would love to have another first round pick. But again, Detroit traded number six to Arizona for pick 12 last season. The Lions traded 6 and 81 to the Cardinals for 12, 34, and 168. Now, I think the price is higher because you would be moving up to take a quarterback. If I know you're moving up to take a tackle, I'm charging you less than if you are moving up to take your future franchise quarterback. And in that scenario, that's exactly what the Las Vegas Raiders would be doing. Their picks in 2024 are 13. 44 in the second round and 77 in the third round. You've got to give me 13, 44, and 77 if you want pick number seven for me. Yeah. And, and what's fascinating, too, about what's being left to is um, so the Raiders we project will move up to get their quarterback. Atlanta may need one depending on if they go get Justin Fields, right? right? You have that conversation. Minnesota also needs one. And Denver, too, which is why the conversation of the Raiders moving up before 11 and 12 makes the most sense to me. It all depends on how these teams view J.J. McCarthy. Jaden Daniels is not part of this discussion whatsoever. No. Because Jaden Daniels is going in the top three picks. So is Drake May. So is Caleb Williams. Those three are off the board in the first three. And that is why you have a scenario where the Raiders are looking to move up. Because when three quarterbacks go in the first three picks, that means J.J. McCarthy's next up. He's the guy that you need at that point. So I think at this point, you're looking at a scenario where at one, two, or three, even if it is someone else moving up to three to take Jaden Daniels, I think he's going by pick number three. I agree with that. The question is, does Washington take another North Carolina quarterback again and go from <laughs> Sam Howell to Drake May? Maybe, maybe not. Or does Washington try to trade up for number one for Caleb Williams? I doubt it.
or, or as you as a Titans fan feel comfortable about drafting another Georgia tackle? I know. <laughs> These are all conversations that and I, we have to have them, but I hate that we have to have them too because mm-hmm. you can't convince me that Mr. Trubisky is a lot like Drake May. Right. Interesting, Arizona last year traded three to Houston for 12. That was the Will Anderson pick. And Houston took C.J. Stroud at two and then got back up to three to take Will Anderson. The Texans sent number 12 and number 33 and first and third round picks in 2024 to the Cardinals for pick number three and a fourth round pick, number 105 last season. That's the price to go get Will Anderson. That's top three, though. At number three overall, but that's a top three pick. Yeah, that's a, that's top three. That's heavy. The price of J.J. McCarthy at seven has to be somewhere between the two. And I've seen a lot of speculation and discussion about you would have to get a first, have to get a 2025 first. I just don't think that's realistic for the Titans moving back from seven to 13. I'm a, I, like... You're getting two picks at least. Where they fall is very fascinating. 44 is what, 12 picks after the first round starts, uh, second round starts. So you still got a lot of quality there. That's where you possibly get a corner. You may get a linebacker. Now, of course, on top of that, Will, to your point, you also are picking up the third round pick in my mind too. And if you bring up the tax of the quarterback, next year has to have either a fourth or a fifth or a third and a five in, included also. These are, as you said, they have to weigh a little bit different. You're going to pay the tax of going to get a quarterback. And, and of course, a top 10 pick versus a top 15. There is a price to be paid. I just don't know how much Rand and, and, and Chad Brinker and, and, and just Coach Callahan will all have as, as far as the expectations. But we know this to be true. Are you willing to lose a little now as far as Joe Alt goes to go get more to build this team up? Because you can't spend everything in free agency. We've already heard this morning from as far as Diana Rossini. They were in a play for Mike Evans. Now, that's a hefty price to be paid. We've heard, Rand, we've heard all these guys speak this preseason by saying what? You got to build this thing from the inside out. Brian Callahan said that also in his presser. You got to build and develop guys inside your building so that you have a level of sustainability as far as winning. The precedent that you are not a team that's going to get everybody else's player because that's costly. I think Mike Evans signing this morning with uh, Mike Evans signing this morning with Tampa Bay Buccaneers at essentially – what is that, $26 million a year average? Like, that's right there was the starting point for him because that, to me, was the hometown discount. Imagine what a guy like Mike Evans would have cost this team, knowing that the fact that they have the most money as free agency is concerned. They also need a guy like him, and you, you, you will have to pay that tax. That's where it becomes problematic. So <laughs> as much as I would hate to say this because I feel like Joe Alt is that short guy, if you're telling me we have the opportunity to pick up three, maybe four premium picks because of going from seven to 13, I'd much rather live in that in that world than to say, all right, we're sticking at seven and we're not going to, or we're going to overspend a free agency. And there's a chance you would have to give up a six or a seven on the back end of that deal as well if you get each of the Raiders' first three picks at that point. Because the Titans don't have a third round pick right now. That turned into Will Levis. The question I have for you, Ramon Foster, is what will Bill Callahan be looking for in potential offensive linemen where he will go to Brian, he will go to Nick Holtz, he'll go to Rand Carthon and say, I can work with that. And specifically in the middle of the first round, we talk a lot about this profile tape. Brian Callahan said it on this show. Hey, we have guys that will come in and do profile tape, our assistant coaches, and show us exactly the kind of player they want to work with. What will Bill Callahan have been showing the scouts and coaches of the Tennessee Titans to say, this is what I want in an offensive lineman? I think you start looking at the division first. Look at the AFC South. See what they have. You know, Indy has some big D tackles. I don't know if Grover Stewart is going to sign back there, but uh, they have a solid defensive line. You look at also Jacksonville, solid defensive line. I think we learned last year that – they're going to have a real strong defense in Houston, too. So the first thing that has to be on your list is how how tough this guy is. And I'm not talking about a $2 stake description. I'm talking about a guy that plays play in and play out and finishes every single play, too. We've also heard that Brian Callahan, the head coach of this team, say what? He liked big university players. 
I think you start with those two things. How's this finish, and where does he come to as far as where does he come from as far as his track record? The things that you can't have um, with with the offensive line group, right? Because at this level, you need to be watching them grow instead of over teaching week in, day in, and day out. How smart are they? Can they uh, take in the playbook? That's another thing. All of these are pretty much non football items first, right? The football things that you need, knee bend. Is he a waist bender? I don't want to live in a world where I'm telling him you're ducking your head every single play. You can't live that life. How good is his core? What well, another thing you can't tolerate is slow feet. Slow feet get beat every single time. Those are the things that you just either are born with or you need to find ways to supplement it. Uh, like I think Joe Alt feet are good. I don't know how great they are as far as speed goes too. But what he does have is size. I, I was told this past weekend um, – a scout friend of mine told me this is like, I asked him, I said, do, do you guys equate for size when it comes down to offensive line play? He said, size is speed. Because if I got a 4-6 DN rushing off against a 6-8, because I was asking specifically about Joe Alt. He was like, if I have a 4-6 speed DN or 4-5, and I got a 6-9 Joe Alt that can size him, I feel like size is speed because I can beat you to the point to where you have to decide on what you're going to do next. That is my speed, is my size. So having a guy that's capable of doing those type of things, I don't need a guy that's too light on his feet either, meaning you don't know how to anchor. It's something we figured out last year. So how many of the guys are in the mix at number seven or even at 38 in the second round that you think this is who Bill Callahan could work with and turn into a good player? Uh, those guys would be, I think, J.C. Latham. Okay. Although primarily right tackle, um, Talisi Fuanga. Yeah, Talisi Fuanga, Oregon State. Who's going up as far as his overall uh, draft status. Tyler Guyton is another guy. Scored a crazy relative athletic score, Tyler Guyton, over the weekend. He tested off the charts. Uh, another dude that I like, too, is Kingsley, Kingsley Siamata, uh, Suamatia. Suamatia. Either way. I'm BYU. Right. BYU. The BYU, BYU tackle. Uh, who's also first cousin with Panay Sewell. Mm. There is a sense of pride in him. And then another one I got to throw him out to as far as tackles go. Um, and he didn't have the greatest senior bowl, but he had a really good, I think, uh, uh, combine, is still Jordan Morgan. I-, I do think there's a level of dog that he needs to contribute to his game more often. Arizona tackle. Jordan Arizona Morgan. tackle, Jordan Morgan. He's athletic enough. He's big enough. He's capable enough of playing. And I'll say this. His senior bowl tape, to me, wasn't as great as his regular season tape with Arizona. He had some really good tape at Arizona. Uh, He finished well. He moved well. He used his hands well. I don't know what that was at the senior bowl, but I, I enjoyed his college tape this past season more than I did his senior bowl. Now, as as Coach Mack has somewhat told us, too, don't be an IE in these moments either, an instant evaluator. Dudes can have one or two bad games or one or two bad days, and that's essentially what the senior bowl practice is. I just didn't like in one of his successions of plays, he got beat, and he got beat again, then he got beat again, then he came out. I did not love that about him, but that is a small window into what he's capable of because – I know some dudes that are just trash players at practice. I'll be just trash at practice. And I'm sure you've all heard about that, too, or he's not the greatest practice guy. Josh Dobbs went through that, did he not? At Tennessee, at the beginning of his career, yeah, he wasn't put in for Justin Worley at first because he didn't practice as well. Didn't practice as well. Um, I think it was Worley, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah it was. <laughs> Imagine that. But you also run into the conversation, too, uh, as, um, as far as a second-round pick. That's where you start to go get a center, too. Is a guy like Zach Frazier a guy that you go to uh, pair up with Will Levis as far as snapping the ball? Cooper Beebe had a good weekend. Cooper Beebe's another one. Kansas that's, State. So that's where you start making those types of picks. Now, again, we don't know what's going to happen as far as free agency, as far as what they want to sign. You might end up signing a tackle. You may end up signing another guard, and center may be your priority in the draft. And that changes to me. That changes everything about what you do in the first round, especially if you're moving back. Who's got the red flags? Who is Bill Callahan going to watch on tape and say, I'm good? Who's who's going to watch on tape and say, I'm good? Um. I could see a little bit Fuaga just simply because I want to see what his feet are really like. Feet aren't quick enough? They're good. I just don't know how great they are in the NFL level. Now, the thing that that teams love about uh, Tali Fuaga is his physicality. 
He is a run block magician. Do you understand me? But here's the other side of him, too. He has said on tape and that he believes it through his heart is he can move over to left. But I think he's a very strong right tackle. So from what you're telling me, Bill Callahan wants bigger linemen with faster feet. Yeah. And he can work with that. And he can work with that. I, I like the guard also, Christian Haynes. I know Burt was on him early in his pre-draft conversation, too, as far as guards. Um, I think you're going to look for a big body guy. Look at who uh, Cleveland had this past year. I mean, they went after uh, Dewan Jones. Dewan Jones, and, and somewhat made him into a player. Who's the Dewan Jones of this class? Amarius Mims. Yeah, he's well, a little more polished. He's a first round guy instead of what a fourth round guy like yeah. Dewan Jones was. Absolutely, Tyler Guyton. Tyler Guyton. No. Okay. Yep, is another one trying of to move guys. from right to left, moving right to left, and just is a little bit of a project former tight end. Also, right. Um, you can tell he's still learning the position. Mm-hmm. That to me is a Dewan Jones type of guy when it boils down to what he's capable of doing. But beyond all of that, Joe Alt still looks far and away the number one tackle. And again, if you took him at seven and didn't overcomplicate any of this, like what they're probably going to do, because I think Joe Alt is most likely on the draft card as we sit here on March the 4th. If he's available, Rand Carthon said last year, Peter Skronsky was a no-brainer pick. That's your no-brainer pick this time. If, if available and you don't move. Here's another idea I'll throw at you. And I'll look to see in the FNM Bank chat who brought this up. Jesse on YouTube. If we trade back, I'd only be happy if Devontae Adams was coming to Tennessee as part of the deal. With the Raiders? If the Raiders wanted to go from 13 to 7. Now, the difficult part of that is if you're moving up to get a quarterback, you're also keeping Devontae Adams to help that quarterback have success as a rookie. So I don't think that's likely that you would invest in the pass game so heavily and take someone like J.J. McCarthy, who's unproven as a rookie, and then get rid of their best asset to be successful in Adams. But maybe. So so this is also where you're going to have to uh, play ball, too, is his, his salary. His base is 16.8. His cap hit is 25.3. That's fine. You live that life? Absolutely. All right, and you get, out after, you get it out after next year, too. Tom Telesco did say at the Combine Tuesday he's a Raider and said uh, he's not going to be traded, but we were told A.J. Brown was a Tennessee Titan until (laughs) he was traded. So many lessons in that year. Mm -hmm. Was that 21 or 22 that happened? 22? A.J. Brown? Yeah. It was two years ago. Two years ago. I was in Vegas for it. Golly. So much to be learned. But the thing is with with a Devontae Adams, though, is – he has an out. So he's a one-year mercenary, essentially, unless you decide to pay that $35.6 million base salary in 25. Mm-hmm. That's where it becomes problematic. Right. You got a bunch of one-year guys. April 28th, 2022 for A.J. Brown. Mm. Is, is that we mark that on our calendars moving forward? Unfortunately. Darkest day. Whether we like it or not. Yeah. 615-737-1045, the final call for phone calls as we begin to wrap up the show. We'll get to headlines we missed. Get your final thoughts next. It's Ramon Foster for Secure Lawn. I'm telling you guys, if y'all are in your cars right now at home or in the office, y'all somewhat may have went outside today and you said, man, it feels like spring. Well, guess what would also feel like spring? Your grass, all right? It's about time to start growing. It's about time for you to start getting it treated. Also, I'm here to tell you that Secure Lawn is focused on providing a prime service to you guys. And you're probably asking, what does prime mean? It means having their team members show up to your house properly trained and prepared to provide a prime service, supplying the 
customer with expectation and making them lifelong customers too. Best thing about them is they're local. They've been serving in Middle Tennessee for over 20 years. Punctual. And another thing is you sign no contracts. If you love them, keep them. If you don't, simply walk away. You're not locked in. So as soon as the weather starts to change, get a secure lawn over to your house to spray some of their awesome sauce on your lawn to kill those pesky weeds so you can be bragging about how green and lush and plush your uh, grass is this year. Call them simply at 615-893-8455 or go to securelawn.com.
Wrapping up the show on a Monday morning edition of Ramon, Kayla, and Will. RKW is brewed by 8th and Roast on a beautiful Monday morning. The Buck Rising Show is up next. 615-737-1045. We've been asking for your best childhood injuries all morning. <laughs> Let's go to Josh in Jacksonville this morning on his. What's up, Josh? Morning, Josh. What's going on, guys? Thank you for taking my call. I'm a big fan of y'all, sir. Thank you. Um, my dumbest injury actually happened in eighth grade. Uh, we were outside for gym class, and, you know, they were all playing football and different things. And so me and my friend are playing football. They're having a good game. They blow the whistle. Gym class is over. And I was like, hey, give me one last throw before gym class is over with. So I run a go out. He puts the ball up high. I track the ball down. I catch the ball. And when I bring my head back down to look straight, I ran right into a ball. Oh. <laughs> now, I did catch the ball. I held on to it. I was going to say, did you complete the process of the catch, Josh? <laughs> I, I did complete the catch. The problem was when I stood up, blood was coming down my face, and oh. I cracked my head open. So, so, so yeah, do, you, do so. you blame yourself or do you blame your friend for having a cannon of an arm? Which one do you blame that's a great question because I went back and forth on that. Ultimately, I blame myself. I just said I listened to the whistle. I, I wouldn't have an injury. So, actually, the scar gave me a scar like Harry Potter. So, for the rest of that year, I was called the Black Harry Potter. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Josh. That's I appreciate the call. <laughs> yeah, we just dropped the ER. I'll just call you Harry Potter. Yeah, that's who you are. Thanks Ten for that points one, to that's Gryffindor yours. for that's making yours, the catch. Bart. Harry Potter. Ten points to Gryffindor. Ten points to Josh, man. We'll go to C and B G. What's up, C? What's up, C? Ramon, Will, Bert. Good morning, gentlemen. How are we doing? Good Great. morning. Good deal. So, uh, Will, you and I are the same age, okay? Okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna throw it back about two decades. I was about five years old. You know, your grandparents uh, back in the day had, like, some old-school type houses, right? Yep. And uh, so we went to my mom's parents' house. And uh, so at their house, they had one of those furnaces in the floor. You know what I mean? Yep. And I would always be told, everybody told me, watch out, watch out, watch out. And I would always tiptoe around it, and it was in between their living room and their kitchen. And I always played a pretty good sneaky attack at staying off that furnace. <laughs> well, one day, I was not thinking in my five-year-old brain, and I go darting from the living room to the kitchen. And it's winter time; We were over there visiting them. And before I realized it, I had two bare feet right over that furnace. Oh. And I stopped. And I looked down and realized what was going on. And before I could get out of the way, bam, seared the bottom of my feet, had same degree burns all over the bottom from that furnace. And we drove the two hours back from visiting my grandparents with my feet in ice buckets, <laughs> trying to chill them out. I never walked over that furnace again. Oh, yeah. that's a good way to learn there, isn't it? Good way to learn. Thank you for the call, C. We appreciate it. Know what I told Bert? This reminds me of Michael Scott with the bacon on the <laughs> George Foreman grill. Oh, no, George I like Foreman. the smell of bacon in the morning. Sue me. <laughs> so, Michael, where are you shipping your foot exactly? <laughs> Put it in bubble wrap. I got burned in a different way as a kid. When I was a kid, um, my buddy used to be a lifeguard at a pool. And so we would get into the pool for free and we were going in there and we were going to stay for just a couple hours, hang out go do something else. And for anybody that's never seen me before, I am of the fair skin. I am someone who, uh, uh, uh You're uh, pale. I, I, I am You're a, a pasty ne- white boy. I am neon white. If you were going to put me in a category, like a fresh t-shirt and our buddy was supposed to come pick us up. Well, he ended up getting a date with a girl, not coming to pick us up. And I stayed at the pool for seven hours with no sunscreen. Oh my gosh. And instead of being neon white, I was radiating red. <laughs> 
I, so bad that I was shivering because and my buddy was like, "It's seventy two in the house right now." I was shaking. Oh. Uh, my buddy's dad had to rub uh, aloe on my back as I <laughs> laid across the, <laughs> the, the ottoman in the middle of the floor. Oh. Most demoralizing thing that I that has happened to me having to have your buddy's dad rub aloe on your back <laughs> and tell you it's going to be okay. I appreciate it, Randy, but I don't want another man to have to touch me like that <laughs> ever again. So now I'm I'm terrified. I'm like one of those fellows wearing like the umbrella hats at yeah. the beach. I am scared to death of getting burnt. Yeah, yeah. Oh, me, oh, my, Bert. That's terrible. I, for a long time as a kid, was not a huge sunscreen guy because I, I have a little bit darker complexion, and so I don't burn super easily. And for whatever reason, that changed around 18 for me. Yeah. And I got into, like, college, and I burn so easily now. I don't know what what the difference is. It's a curse. I guess. Because, I, I, I mean, I, I'm not outside as much as I was when I was still running. You know, you run that many miles in a week, and you probably just build up, like, natural tan. Oh, for sure. That's that way you're a bit it. more protected. Probably that probably it. is that's it. probably Because that's right around the time I stopped running all the time. Dang, man. Yeah, you should have went back outside. That, that, as, as, a, as a black man also, I used to not wear sunscreen either until you now start you going to baseball tournaments yeah, and realizing, right. like, your forehead would get toasted. It's always the worst parts of your body, too, that you never know. It's like, dang, yeah. that sucks getting that burnt. One time I fell asleep on my belly, and the bottom of my feet got yes. burnt. Yes. No, I was going to ask, what what is the worst part of your body to get a sunburn on? Your feet. Totally I think it's a hundred. I think it's the top of your feet. No, middle of your chest. I'm new to this, so you probably already have. <laughs> <laughs> on I the think, cruise last year. Shut up. The experts are talking. <laughs> I think your legs are bad, hey, too. Hey, sit this one out, pal, all right? This ain't for you. Yeah. I'll take it from here. You got a lot of valuable experience playing in the NFL. This is where this is where uh, Robert and I are the veterans here, all right? You you sit over there, rookie. You're right. You're right. You're right. Y'all got it. Hey, quiet, quiet, quiet down over there. Top of your feet and top of your shoulders for me Yep, are the two. Because if those are ones that, like, depending on what you're wearing, you're going to be in pain regardless like, there are certain parts of your body, like your nose or your ears or something, nothing's touching that as far as clothing goes, but a shirt is always touching your shoulders, and socks or shoes are always touching your tops of feet. Oh, The other part for me is the inside of your thighs. If you've ever been kayaking, the sun hits on them bad boys perfectly, and anytime you walk, if you get to chub rub like me, oh, uh, right. it's like starting a fire. The old, the old I don't way. need more details on that. That's the show on your Monday morning. Tomorrow, <laughs> Charles Davis at 8.05, Austin Price at 8.20, Ron Slay at 9.20. And more shenanigans just like these for four hours to kick off your Tuesday morning. Ramon Foster, please, for the love of God, send us home. No one to interject in conversations, okay? <laughs> the sunburnt one for me, but at all times, your Twitter fingers and your mic is always hot, baby.